Okay, perfect. We're live. All right. So, so as I was talking about um, prior to going live, they said you did an interview with the Roger guy. Yep, I did. Had podcast on the 18th, which was excellent. So how does he feel with um, Uber and Lyft? You know now charging more in pricing because you know that interview he didn't really address it with Jeff Black. I'm sorry, I said Jeff Black with um Dara. That's the yeah, I'm um, echoing here. And you're breaking up a little bit. Let's try the. Mm. Oh, okay. I think. Hold on. And you're breaking up a little bit. Let's try the. This is a operator error. Yeah, oh, okay. I think. Hold on. And you're breaking up a little bit. Let's try the. There we go. Check here. All right. I think now we're in the now we're in the game. You got to turn mine off. It should be good. All right. We got, we got, to turn we got live chat going. Good evening, everybody. Should, do we actually have some viewers now? Looks like we might. I'm so far. Let me check here and see what we got going on here. Seven people. So, All right. Hey, guys, if you're in the chat, go on and um, leave a comment. Uh, hit the like button. Uh, but So your conversation with um, the rise here guy, because I always wonder, you know, he seems like... Um, he, I don't want to say works for Uber, but he seems like he's paid by all the companies because he seems like the top guy in regards to YouTube. Um, the conversation you had with him, was he an advocate for us or is he kind of like in between? No, I think I think the rideshare uh, the rideshare guy, well, it's, uh, and the, the show is Show Me the Money Club is what okay. they call their Tuesday night live show. That is a show where they're they're pretty ruthlessly honest they don't pull any punches and in fact i think they've been very direct in terms of interviewing uh uber and lyft executives and speaking very honestly about the challenges that they're facing whether it be in rates or whether it be in uh the disclosure of, of information like locations and things like that uh they're certainly having a website the rideshare guy and and having this show which which has you know they get twelve thousand viewers per episode uh on their on their youtube shows that have been up for a while they definitely have sponsors right they have uh, they're connected to sponsorship because because they're running a, a real business there and they've got a pretty good size operation but i think they keep it they keep it pretty real um it's definitely not what i would say is is sponsored content in any way shape or form and i think that's really one of the interesting things that that sergio you know sergio uh one of the hosts there and i talked about on the phone after the show is that in a lot of ways i think the gig economy is a phase and the thing that the, the, the entity that has been here and will be here is this large workforce of low wage uh, labor, of available labor. What is not necessarily a lasting element is the gig economy itself. I think the gig economy is more of a phase. Uh, and, and really, I think that phase is, is highlighted by the fact that, that these gig apps are siloed and isolated such that their view of the world is not the real world their view of the market is not a real market and so the end of that story or the, the the story of the doordash singularity which we talk about in the full dash closure book in the podcast is that they're not getting the consent the informed consent of the laborers in the gig apps and they're not honest with the laborers in the gig apps about the data that they have so in, in my view, over time, the gig economy in the way that it's structured today, the Uber, Lyft, DoorDash, Grubhub style of, of gig economy can't last because it's a scam. It's a scheme. It's, it's a way for them to take a percentage of total revenues with no capital investment, no workforce, no jobs provided, uh, no training, no security, no nothing, right? They're, they're just kind of throwing people to the wolves uh, 
uh, as laborers out there. And of course, the quality suffers. Of course, the people doing the work suffer because they're not supported even to the extent that someone with a job would be. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense because, and by the way, um, you know, shout out to Jake Havley. Um, what's going on with you? So here's the thing. Um, I didn't realize this all was going on because of the fact that they suck you in when you first start doing ride share by giving you all the bonuses and they give you the best rides available um, before, you know, like the best crap rides available. And then after like a couple of years of being brainwashed, a bunch of us being brainwashed and thinking that, you know, we can maintain seven to six thousand dollars a month in our sleep that's in our sleep but then we're doing ten thousand dollars a month like it ain't nothing um you now are hooked in thinking it's always going to be that way because you know this is the only industry that can literally um pay people a certain way and then give you a demotion at at their will you know they said hey we got to cut the pay because this and that and they did it and then now you have um as i was talking to you before off camera you have um YouTubers who are pushing out videos to hire or get more people onboarded, which is going to ultimately saturate the market even more than what it is. Because now, as you can see, and as you know, you saw in my story, you know, I've I've been um recklessly like trying to make rideshare work up until what a few days ago. Now I'm going back to college because you know I thought that okay, they said my audio is kind of fuzzy. Um, let me know in the comments if that's better. Um, Torin and Porta. Um, let's go over my You're a little on the high side right now. So somewhere in the middle between where you were and where you are. Okay. Let me try. Um, I'm going to actually connect to my AirPods. Let me see if that sounds better. Good evening, everybody. The truth keeper can't hear audio is terrible. So is the audio uh, okay for me? Truth keeper, is it is, is it that, that's fuzzy? Does that sound better? It does sound better to me. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna use my AirPods for now. Yeah, this mic is letting me down. But yeah, yeah you yeah. um, okay, perfect. But yeah, you have a situation where you know I was so brainwashed by these companies that I had people, um, such as I believe um, Torin Brown actually went in on me a couple of times to where they're telling me to go get a regular job, go to, to get a skill. Get, you know, pretty much get out of rise here because I'm never going to get ahead and I'm fighting the power because I'm so brainwashed. Like, no, it's going to be better this month. Trust me, I'm going to make 250 this month or 200 that month. And the problem just there's no rides because it's oversaturated. Um, they're paying less money with lift out here. They're getting away with paying 80 to 90 cents per mile. Like, if there, there's a 20 mile um, ride, you know, from pickup to drop off, they tell you, they have to tell you the information um, up front. That ride would only pay you $18. That's a that's considered a good ride to some people because they can get that ride done in forty minutes. Right. So that's kind of um, where I'm at with um you know that tap out and walk away. So you know I'm trying to do what you're doing in regards to educating more people so that way people aren't stuck in the you know oh, there's the hamster wheel that I'm I was stuck in forever not listening to all these people trying to give me advice on you know doing something better in my life than you know ride share. Let's, let's talk about that for a second, because you, cause you, okay. you said a number of things that I think we need to unpack. Number one, I think you alluded to the fact that there's a there's a very clear bait and switch that has happened to anyone in this industry. When I started Rideshare, which is ne or not Rideshare, I've never done Rideshare, I should say DoorDash, uh, right? And uh, when I started DoorDash during the pandemic about two and a half years yeah. ago, there was a different pay scale in DoorDash, there was a different amount that you could make per day. And that amount has continuously ratcheted down. Basically, the, the feeling you get when you're out doing it is you can feel this compression of your wages coming every single day. It's just that little bit harder to succeed in financially than it was the day before. And so, again, let's go back to the point that this is not a market based system. This is an isolated gamed market by every single one of these gig app providers. The whole point of an app is to take it away from the internet, to take it away from the yep. data, to take it away from reality. And on the app, you're getting a little sliver of reality that allows them to manipulate you. So what happened to you, Dennis, is what happened to all of us. And so I think 
like many uh, ride share and gig economy workers, I think you're being a little hard on yourself in terms of what you experience. So, so that would be number one. Number two, I think you've got the aspect of that it is simple, but it's not easy. This is, this is very difficult, tiring work. And if you're out there driving around seven to 10 to 12 hours a day, as a lot of us were and some of us still are, let me tell you, when you're done with that, your ability and time to go seek another job or to find another path doesn't yep. exist because you can't cut off your income to go find income. So it's a trap. And they know that this is this is a trap that takes people like you and me out of the workforce, takes us into another market where our income is is squeezed. And then final part let's talk about is is the addiction, right, that that people become addicted to the gamification intentionally by these companies yep. of these apps. And so. They want to succeed. They want to work hard. They want to win. And I know you, Dennis, because I've known you for a while. You're a damn hard worker. And I can tell you, I, I went out that. there and hustled my ass off. And so yeah. they're taking advantage of our work ethic and our desire to be successful and, and using that against us. So I just I want to give more credit than most gig app workers get because in a lot of way, gig, ways, gig app workers are like entrepreneurs or like the hardest working people out there. But socially and economically, we're in the sewer. And so the respect that we get and a lot of times the respect that we give ourselves isn't where it should be. When the fact is, as most kinds of labor, it's very hard work. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. And the piggyback on that. Um, I'll, I'll speak one truth that might be kind of controversial. Um, I appreciate that, Mark. Let's see this comment here by Marvin. And by the way, Woodrow Blue, um, the food been slow, um, very slow. Uh, food's been slow lately. Very, very slow in my market, I'm assuming. That's what he's saying. You're absolutely right. Um, it's been slow all over. Only in, um, there's a couple states um, that are pretty solid still, but otherwise slow all over the place. Um, and then um, this guy's very informative. That's the reason why I brought him on. He's a writer. His contact info, you know, between Twitter and um, you have a YouTube channel also. Um, it's all in the uh, comment or in the details for this video. Yeah, and, um, and so um, I'll take the opportunity. So this is this is a, a joint uh, production, if you will, mm -hmm. with with Dennis and myself. Uh, this is actually episode number six of the Full Dash Closure audiobook and podcast. And that's available on all podcast platforms uh, freely, as well as Substack. And then there's also the book, which is in progress. The first three chapters are up on Substack. Uh, and that is uh, the full title of the book is called Full Dash Closure, Awakening from the Human Exploitation of DoorDash Singularity. And the, the, the summary of that title, quickly, is that a singularity in this sense is a system or a communication in which the human receiving that information can't tell if it's organic, if it's human created, or if it's artificial intelligence created. And, and what that does is, let's imagine playing a game of chess. If I'm playing a game of chess against you, Dennis, I may or may not have a chance of winning. You'll probably beat me, but at least I know that I'm playing a human being. Now, if I'm playing you online and all of a sudden you put on the artificial intelligence that beat the world champion and it beats my pants off and you say, hey, I won. Now, that's that would be a situation that would be somewhat akin to a singularity in that I think I'm playing a human and I'm getting a pants beat off being three moves when, in fact, I'm playing artificial intelligence that can do six million predictions a second, and uh, no human being can keep up with artificial mm -hmm. intelligence that can precisely yeah. predict your moves uh, with six million predictions a second. And that's precisely what's happening to you in DoorDash. That's what's happening to you in, in Uber. That's what's happening to you in Lyft. These are phenomenons of data science and artificial intelligence that were kind of thrust upon us because of the pandemic 
But in reality, they're very bad for humanity. And really, they should have never existed in the first place. Because without the pandemic, the fact is that 85% of restaurants and 99% of retailers never in the history of humanity had delivery services until the pandemic. And so Mm. if we take that fact that none of these things were necessary in the history of humanity until the pandemic, I think we can get back to this addiction, but from the consumer side and say, consumers are addicted to this lazy ass convenience. Consumers are addicted to an app, to this, I'd call it gratuitous convenience that's now available to them that never, ever, ever would have existed without the pandemic. And so, you know, timing is everything. And DoorDash most certainly took advantage of that. Rideshare companies I consider a little bit different because rideshare companies are a direct competition and replacement for taxi cabs and limousines and shuttle services and all other kinds of human transportation that have been around. It's just a different business model for transportation that's been around. So right, all of these dynamics have kind of combined together to create what they call the gig economy. But the problem with the gig economy is it is it uses human beings as fuel. And it uses them up and spits them out. And uh, Dennis and I have both been spit out the other side, and it doesn't feel so good. Absolutely. And to touch on uh, what you said here, see, one of the things, too, that happened, um, so with the pandemic, um, I actually started doing Uber in, what, 2013, pandemic. Uh, <laughs> but before, um, yeah, I'd say pan- pandemic, I don't know what, what where I was going with that, but Pretty much, I started doing Uber in 2013, and at that point, I think it was like a 20-80 split. So they got 20, we got 80. Then it dipped to a 30-70 split. Then it dipped to they just pay us whatever they think they should give us. And they were um, dropping the, the rate every year, and we had to take it because you had to sign that, that agreement to continue driving on the platform. So the situation you face is um, when uh, COVID happened, um, you had people who – the only means to make their only means to make money was ride share. So they started driving. So um, ride share companies at that point, they still weren't taking more than 50 or cent. Now they're taking more than 50. But the one thing that I used to tell people, I used to get in the car. I'm like, I appreciate ride share because a lot of people who not calling us as a whole lazy, but there's a lot, there's a huge sector of ride share drivers who we would rather instead of getting, and when I say lazy, I mean like if we had to go get a manual labor job, because what we qualify for, we don't have any skill, we don't have any um, type of you know degree or whatever to go get a, a job um, that's paying you know your way out of poverty. So I'm talking about people making say twenty, thirty thousand a year working at McDonald's, Walmart, whatever such. Now you have opportunity to where you can make fifteen, two thousand dollars a week. Like I literally went from I was throwing parties and doing all of that at the nightclub, um, the bar, and then when I lost it all, um, I literally went to. You know, I moved to Las Vegas, started doing ride share. I'm now making fifteen to two thousand dollars in my sleep. Um, you know, working ten to twelve hours a day, sometimes sixteen hours, and I'm making four hundred dollars. And it got addicting because now I'm making r- real, real money. You know, like I'm making career money. I'm making eighty thousand minimum a year. That's what I was sold on. So now that I worked the same amount of time now in 2022 and 2021. Uh, actually, maybe even more time than I did in 2013, and I'm barely making fifty thousand and um, net profit. Um, considered on the books, um, my net income was twenty nine thousand for last year, and I grossed, you know, over in ride fares, I grossed over sixty thousand in ride fares. You know, um, I put a lot of miles on my car, and I got comfortable with losing, and that's ultimately what I've been doing the past two years, losing because. You know, ride share allows people who, when I say lazy, we just, some of us, we just rather, you know, we get in the car and we drive and I get it as work, but at the same time, it's easy. You know, I'd rather do this than do something I got to like get my hands dirty. And you don't really have to have much of a skill other than know how to drive, communi- uh, get communication skills in regards to you know, customer service with your passenger. Um, all you need, and then you need the will to work. So it put a lot of people who would normally stay home and do nothing or, um, you know, live off people, their parents, whatever, it put them to work. That was the biggest thing I loved about Rideshare because everybody I knew that were literally lazy, like didn't want to do anything, I, I put them on the Rideshare and they were doing it. They were doing delivery apps. Like they're out here grinding. They went from working maybe 
20 hours at like McDonald's a week to working 50 hours with Raja because it's addicting. It's like well, a let, gamble. Let's let's talk about that for a second. And um, as okay. as uh, with most gig economy workers I've seen, you're a little hard on yourself, Dennis. And um, what I've seen with both Rideshare and DoorDash or Grubhub, which we'd call last mile delivery, right? And you and Amazon Spark or or, or Amazon Flex, Walmart Spark, those kind of things, last mile delivery, right? So those are kind of the two different categories. You've got Rideshare, which is like a cab, but a yeah. different business model. And then you've got last mile delivery, which is picking up something, taking it somewhere else and dropping it off, right? So again, it's simple, but it's not easy. When you're out on the road all day long and you have to pay attention to your driving, your safety, pickups, drop-offs, everything else, this is not a job for the brain dead, number one. Yeah. Number two, it is exhausting hard work, but because you are working on your own, you can also keep a semblance of dignity, if you will. And, and I think one of those oh, yeah. problems with, with those other jobs, with McDonald's, with whatever else, with people that maybe are living in their parents' basement, I'm not so sure that they don't want to work as much as that they would prefer to work with dignity. And, oh, yeah. it, and, and I think that's, that's really the crux of it because I don't believe that the disenfranchised low wage labor of the United States, which which a lot of times, by the way, includes people with masters in business administration like myself uh, and people with lots of higher education that just have different circumstances in their lives. And certainly the pandemic was a different circumstance, right? If you were a consultant oh, yeah. and you were used to getting out and meeting people and and collaborating, the the uh, the, the pandemic wasn't so good for you. And that's how I found myself driving for DoorDash is that there just wasn't opportunity for me to, to take care of my needs. And so DoorDash was something that, boy, I had to swallow really hard. And, and uh, as I said, the first day I went out and did it, that it's the only thing I could think of that is slightly less worse than sitting at home and looking for a job I couldn't find. So so, uh, you know, it's it's something that some of us go into swallowing hard because we have no other options. It's something that others of us go into because we want a job with more dignity than than we think our skills allow in the workplace. Both of those, I think, are bigger problems with corporate America and with America and with the labor economy itself than it is with us workers, because I really think that most people, if given the opportunity to support themselves with dignity, would take that opportunity to do that. So I, I'm gonna I'm gonna argue that it's a dignity problem more than a workforce problem. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna okay. So let me clean that up. Um, what I meant to say when I say lazy, um, that was actually bad wording. Um, what I mean is this: um, I prior to doing ride share, you know, I was a guy that had. Um, you know, management job for nightclub. Pretty much I built the brand of this nightclub. Um, mm -hmm. I had various bars that I um, rehabbed, um, were able to, was able to get them back on track. And then I had um, an entertainment company that I was putting on concerts and events, et cetera. So when I went to Vegas, I went to Vegas with no skills because in reality, what I was doing was something that I learned um, with my own money to do. But if I go to a marketing firm or go to a bar in Vegas, whatever such, my experience is not going to translate to hire this guy on paper from my past, you know, um, experience in, 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 in the industry. So I had to start over. So what I mean by um, lazy is more of, um, and I don't know the right word for it. You're the writer, so you can actually correct that. But what I meant to say is that people such as myself who um, chose to not go back to uh, get a skill or learn a trade, you can get that in a year and a half or, go back to college and chase a dream. Um, we chose to do ride share because at the time you're making $30 an hour. Now we both know to make $30 an hour after, you know, the tax and gas, you're at about $24, $23. And back in 2013 to 2000, I think 17, 16 started to change. But back then to make that kind of money um, with um, inflation not being a thing um, back then, you would have to have some type of skilled job. You're not making that driving around. Unless 
you are a skilled taxi driver, you're long hauling people. So um, the reason why I say lazy is, I mean, people who choose, like I just tapped out. I didn't want to start over. I just figured I ran into this ride share gig and I was able to make $2,000 a week, you know, and I'm making, you know, you call it big boy money where I'm from, big boy money. And I didn't have to go to school. I didn't have to learn a trade. I didn't have to invest anything other than my car and my time. You know, that's what I mean. So what I mean by the mom's basement is there's so many, it's a sector of drivers and I'm included in the sector of driver, drivers who if it was for a ride share, I wouldn't be living with my mom because of the fact I would just go get a job at McDonald's or whatever I would qualify for and work my way up. But there's a huge sector of us who this is easy work. Um, you make more than we feel we deserve at one point. Now it's opposite because now you're barely making 15, 16 an hour. But back then you got to remember, in 40 hours, I was making $1,500. Most professionals, a lot of professionals don't make 15, you know, um, take home for 40 hours. Okay. You know, over, so, you know, 60K. So. Okay. So, so what we're getting into here is, uh, is the labor economy and yeah. the income inequality of America. Uh, as somebody wrote in uh, my Twitter account, America is a, is a country of uh, a wealthy country of poor people, I think it said. Yep. So, so the issue I think is mu again, you're being too hard on yourself, darn it, Dennis. Yep. Um, the question is whether labor is compensated fairly period, right? The, the productivity of labor versus the minimum wage has diverged over time where productivity keeps going up and the wages for for labor keep going down right unions have suffered the advent of the gig economy is nothing but a naked attempt to skirt laws of employment right and and skirt the responsibilities of employment in which there's a, a relationship where both employees and the company benefit through work. And so what this gig economy is, is it decided that it would, they would, corporations decided if we could set up a system where we didn't have to share anything with the employees, we didn't have to recognize them as employees or human beings or anything but a number, we just plug them into artificial intelligence and we run them like a little machine, right? They figured out if they could do that, that the profits were almost unlimited. And so the reason that they were able to transition you from a wage up here, lower and lower and lower, is that they were gaming you the entire time with, with the way that they were incentivizing you, with the, with the, what they showed you of where you should go and how you should operate. All of it is a lie, right? All of it is a alternate reality that only benefits them. And, and artificial intelligence is behind all of this, even in the case of, of you talking about getting a job and what your skills are. So I'll, I'll tell you a little anecdote about me, right? So I have a master's okay. in business administration from, from Duke University. It's, it's one of the top 10 business schools in the United States, maybe in the world. Okay. Um, I've had success in the corporate world in my life, not that I enjoyed it and not that I'd go back for in any way, shape or form. But today, if I send out my resume and, and you know, let's pretend that it has qualifications on it, no human's ever gonna see it. That resume, just like yours, is gonna be combed with what? Artificial intelligence. Yeah. So not only is artificial intelligence manipulating us in the work that we have, it's manipulating what jobs we might get. And so somebody like you, Dennis, or maybe somebody like me, that's a very hard worker, uh, with both of us are, are ambitious, want to take care of our families, want to live a, a decent life and with, with dignity and have a roof over our head and eat and have a car to drive, maybe have a partner in our lives that we love, maybe take care of some kids, right? The people that are looking to do that, we send our resumes now out or a job application out no human's ever seen it. So we've, we've disembodied the humanity of you, Dennis. You're a person who is absolutely talented. You're, you're terribly handsome, obviously. Appreciate that. 
if you're, if you're a speaker, you're ambitious. So does that come through when you send in a job application? Not at all. And yeah. so in the old days, right, and I'm getting pretty old. Uh, I was born in the 60s. So in the old yeah. days, we used to look somebody in the eye or they'd read your resume or they talked to you on the telephone. And so if you were ambitious and you were a hard worker and you could convince somebody to give you a shot, you had a shot. And those were the old days of labor when you had a shot. Now, we're, we're all nothing but numbers, right? Our experience, this, this who you are, this education that I know that you want to get, Dennis, and I'm sure will be, will be wonderful for you, that's still not an entry into a system that's locked you out with artificial intelligence. It's a club and we're not in it, right? That is, that is the labor market. And so, yeah, I think, I think labor in total and the majority of workers in the United States are just getting short trip right now and it can't continue. It's not sustainable. No, absolutely. I mean, I think that um, it's kind of, um, we're at a point that the reason why people don't realize the reason why, but I really need to shout out to these people, rare one, Shout out to you. Um, miss you too. Um, Loki Fur, once again, I appreciate the comment there. Um, reptile Lifestyle, Inconvenient Troops. Absolutely. Yes, um, they are. And anybody with trader, gl glad to take questions, please, by all means. Uh, type a question in, we'll try and we'll try and answer it. So, yeah, so I, yeah, I think this is this is a problem where the gig economy is only a small gig economy reflects the issue. The gig economy is not the issue. And again, I'm going to go back and argue, as I told the Sergio on uh, of the rideshare guy and, and the show me the money club podcast yeah. that the gig economy can't last because it's deceptive. It's not transparent. It's not organic. It's literally a crime and and it's a crime that hasn't been prosecuted yet. But but history will show that the DoorDashes, Ubers and Lyfts and their schemes of obfuscate, obfuscating data that they have that you need and they don't give you because they want to manipulate you and and running inorganic markets, you know, fixed markets, gamed markets and pretending that they're that they're real markets and, and advertising them as such to contract labor. This is all basic contract law violations, right? And so the, the key to the gig economy is that the only rule is there are no rules. This is a segment of the economy that was created solely as a scheme and nobody stopped them. Right. These these companies, uh, Lyft, Instacart, Uber, DoorDash and Grubhub are spending in excess of six million dollars uh, in this fiscal year for lobbying. And they spent millions upon millions on said how much uh, over six million dollars this year on lobbying from those five companies. And in addition to that. Every time there's a local statute, a Prop 22, something in New York, whatever, these, these companies will spend untold millions in advertising to, to sway that vote. They're doing it in Australia. They're doing it in Canada. They're doing it in what was the latest country I just saw them uh, attempting to fleece. I don't remember, but uh, DoorDash is now in 27 countries, right? And so they're keenly aware that their entire existence depends upon governments not regulating their fraud. And the problem is that with the book Full Dash Closure and with a lot of work that other people are doing, this jig's gonna be up because illusions only work until the illusion is exposed. Once, once you know how the trick works, it's not magic anymore. And so you and I were taken by some magic. And, and just to clarify, when I was actually doing this job, right, when I was spent two years uh, on and off door dashing, I didn't understand this. I knew I was being gamed. I knew I was being manipulated. But I didn't understand the full extent of the door dash singularity, of the fact that there was nothing organic and that everything was gamed and that we're each markets of one, 
my view of the world provided to me through this gig app on DoorDash is my view of the world. And it's completely unique. And it's gaming me like a chess master playing me. Every move I make, no matter which way I go, it's got me beat. Okay? okay. And so I didn't know that, right? Once I started writing this book about all the horrible injustices and the abuses of DoorDash, I uncovered to myself a bigger world of artificial intelligence and a bigger world of data science that I've now been researching for about the last seven months. And it blew my mind. I mean, I, I walked around just shouting daily about the horror that I discovered in the way that we were being gamed and manipulated and deceived criminally. Right. And, and I have no problem saying that this is this is a crime that is being perpetrated against us. And just because it hasn't been prosecuted yet doesn't mean it's not a crime. Right. They're withholding material information every time they send out an offer to an independent contractor. You can't ask somebody to sign a contract and lie to them about the scope of the contract while you're doing it. That's not the real yeah. world. Only in the gig economy are you allowed to lie and then uh, tell somebody they signed the contract that allows uh, that allows you to be lied to. It's it's absurd. Yeah. It's completely absurd, and it's because these funds are coming from SoftBank, from billionaires, literally from billionaires that are running schemes around the world. They're funding these schemes, and then Uber and DoorDash subfund the other schemes, the new schemes, the robotic schemes, the self-driving car schemes, all these schemes that are going to take these people that have dedicated their time to the gig economy and flush them down the toilet as soon as possible because the only thing these companies are motivated by is to pay their independent contractors the smallest amount yeah. possible. That's it. The, the problem with the gig economy is that Unlike an employee employer relationship where you're both going the same direction, you've both got the same goals, they're diametrically opposed goals. The corporation's goal yeah. is to make their profit maximized, to grow, and to produce the most amount of revenue and profit and wealth that they can while buying markets. And so a lot of them don't show a profit because they're spending all their money buying new markets around the world. But when they're doing that, Right. This is this is coming from really just a few different sources that are monopolizing uh, labor and really breaking that employee relationship so that corporations have one goal and labor has another goal. And who's going to win that fight? Who's going to win a tug of war between a gorilla and a mouse? The gorilla is going to win. Corporation. Yeah. Ultimately, right. so, yeah. So this is this is just a dysfunctional system by design. It's a system by design to take advantage of uh, the most vulnerable labor and the most vulnerable consumers who get addicted to this app, right? And and when DoorDash talks about it, when you go to their data science side and you hear them talk about how they design this and the insidious ways that they work you know that their goals are addiction, right? They want gig app laborers addicted, and they certainly want consumers addicted to this gratuitous convenience. They don't need lots of customers. They need a few customers that order every damn day. That's what they want. And if they, get, if they somehow get shut out of a jurisdiction because they're doing a, a, a scam, they're doing a business that should be illegal. Well, that's why they diversify. That's why DoorDash is now in 27 countries because they know all it would take would be, a, a, you know, some solid labor law in any one of these jurisdictions and they're out of business, right? This isn't a business model that can succeed without the subsidy that they're putting in from investors, right? They're, they're doing a below the market sale to consumers and they're paying labor below market wages all to corner the market. This is the Amazon model, but Amazon's also the first corporation in the history of the world to lose a trillion dollars, one trillion dollars of market value. 
that How did they Amazon do that? lost. Well, because How did they do I mean, that? right. So, so the market value is just the, the number of shares times the share yeah. price, right? And yeah. so, their market value has dropped. Their their total market capitalization, you call that, has dropped by over a trillion dollars. Yeah, I thought they were going up. So they actually are dipping now. I mean, is it dipping like to a scary number? They, these companies are all built upon monopolization schemes, right? So their goal is to get so much business that then they can bait and switch, change the terms, raise the prices, everything else, right? Walmart used to be kind of the corporate bad guy because they moved into yeah. small towns and brought in all these artificially low prices and they lowered them even more. They put out a whole, but put a lot of local businesses out of business. Absolutely. Right. And they raise their prices back up. And this, so this is, this is a common scheme that's been used many, many times, but in this day of now gig apps, we're all carrying these smartphones. They now have a way to pull this scam on a level and with artificial intelligence, so they've, they've really got the biggest labor scam in the history of humanity. Never, ever before in the history of humanity has labor been so vulnerable to corporations and they're taking full advantage of it, which is what corporations do. I mean, you can't expect them to do anything else. So we've got a real problem on our hands. I mean, really, this, this gig economy is the razor's edge of the end of jobs and work and employment as we know it. And it's, it's an existential threat. It's a life-threatening uh, life threatening threat to yeah. humanity. I mean, here, here's the thing to touch on, um, more so what you just said here. Um, I, I tell people that, I mean, this might not be true, this might be something random, but I tell people that um, what Uber and Lyft and these companies do, they have psychiatrists that work with them and they literally um, have a certain amount of like test subjects that they test these prices or these rates on and they try to figure out the lowest number that drivers would take. And then when they realize this with these 10 to 100, whatever so many people that they test on, now they push it to everybody. So with that said, let me explain to you one thing, the reason why um, they sucker a lot of people, and not to make this a race issue because it's not, but just I'm speaking on me, um, where I'm from. Um, people, I mean, my community, Youngstown, Ohio, is a poor you know, city. So for the most part, if you're making $2,000 a month, then you're living, you're hood rich, you know, where I'm from. This is, I'm talking 2013 before I'm doing right. So you make a $2,000 a month, you're living good. So um, now, because inflation, you're at about twenty-five, dollars to $3,000 to be living good in Youngstown, which for anybody else, I mean, if somebody told you, you know, when you graduated the high school, I'm sorry, college um, with your degrees, if somebody told you you're going to go and make $40,000 a year, wouldn't you have a nervous breakdown or would you be like, okay, I mean, that's what everybody else makes and just, or make and just go with the flow or would you, you know, what would you do personally? Like, is that, because that's the first part of my question. And then I'm going to explain the reason why I'm even asking you that question. Um, if you would be happy with 40 to $50,000 a year. It, you know, I really can't answer that question effectively because I don't, I don't think I understand the, the economics of the market well enough. I, but I, I understand your point in that, in that everyone's looking for the best opportunity. Uh, just, just like a corporation, we all want to make sure that we get the most income for the, the least amount of work, right? Um, and that's, yeah. that's not being lazy. That's, that's just being human, right? That one of, one of the greatest lies of the gig economy, and DoorDash loves this one, is that they talk about that, that their workers want flexibility and it's all about flexibility and flexibility. Well, you know, put your ankles behind your ears. You're, you're flexible. That ain't going to get you paid. Right. And so they're lying to regulators about what the workforce wants and needs, because, of course, why do we work? We work for money. We don't work for flexibility. We do yoga okay. for flexibility. Right. We might meditate for mental flexibility, but but we sure as hell aren't uh, working for flexibility. We're working to work and earn money. 
And what you talk about from a psychological standpoint, absolutely. The idea of these apps, the idea of the way that they present their love to you is, is psychological warfare, right? They're, they're, they're showing you this lie of the singularity, telling you that you're valued and loved and you're one of the team, while in reality, they're squashing you like a bug. And so it is psychological warfare. And one of the questions I want to ask you about, Dennis, and I don't want to, I don't want to dodge a question about the wages in the economy, but I know for you, and I know for basically every, uh, every gig economy worker I've had, this has had a significant effect on your mental health. Yeah, yeah I'll tell you, and, and let me address that, um, finish up that um, question about the income. The reason why I mentioned that is because where I'm from, $30,000, you're living good, okay? So you got to remember, when I left Youngstown, I was putting on parties and I'm making like four or $5,000, literally a party. And I'm putting, you know, two of these um, on a month. So I'm making good money, got comfortable. So here's the situation. Um, when I got out of that industry and I started now driving rideshare, I'm making fifteen to $2,000 a week. So now I'm literally making, you know, the 80000 plus a, a, a year, but I'm in Las Vegas. I'm living like a king to where if my family back in the day, uh, in the 2013, 14, if they asked to borrow $20, that's like, oh my God, thank you. I had it to where I can give my family $50. There you go. It was nothing to me. But now um, we're back to a point that they took us, they, they brought us all the way up to where we're making five, 6,000 a month to where now we're back down to making barely two to $3,000 a month. So now we're literally making close to really in reality, minimum wage. So that's what right. I meant by um, is they're exploiting not just not just the black thing, black people, um, you know, but poor people. And, you know, we have a high um, statistically um, speaking, um, high level of poverty in our community. So they're exploiting people like me. They're exploiting other poor people who, you know, we are happy with these low wages. So in regards to the mental health side of it. The past 10 years, you know, and I haven't really talked about this too much, but I'm going to start talking about it the next couple of weeks. I've been kind of vague about it, but my mental health issues, you know, it started due to, i be honest with you, the gambling. I talked to people about that before on this channel. I did a video on it. I had a big, big gambling problem. And 2013, that was part of the reason why I left, because when I lost my business, uh, entertainment company, and I lost my um, deal with the nightclub, you know, I performed over what I needed to do to get the conversation I was, um, you know, I was agreed upon and have a contract. So I went to gamble because I was trying to, you know, get over the fact I lost, you know, the business that I literally built from the heart, you know, everything that I wanted in a business, this nightclub, I put into this business. So that happened. And then um, my entertainment company, I had, you know, just snatched away from me. So those two things started the decline for me to where I started gambling. But then I stopped gambling in 2013 for a while, and that's when I picked up rideshare because I didn't have to. I was trying to gamble my way back into all the money that I fumbled away um, with the different business endeavors I was in. So for the past 10 years, I've been doing rideshare. Uh, I might have had maybe, let's call it two and a half years off to where I had my um, business. I had a nightclub. Um, then prior, I was invested in the old nightclub that you know was taken away from me. But... Other than that, I've been doing ride share and I've been the first four years of ride share was great. My mental health was great. You know, I was happy. Um, I was able to tell people I love them and, you know, I was able to hug people. You know, I had a social life. You know, I was able to date. Everything was okay. But then when um, the tail end of Vegas happened, um, the rate started to drop. They took away the percentage. I think this is 2017 or 18. Took away the percentage and started paying a flat mileage like they charge the passenger and they just tell us after the rides over what we're going to get um at that point it started to decline then they started not giving us as many bonuses so then um you started having like the service animals things that cost money because i had to you know uh, clean up the, the urine that usually happened and, you know these different things that's happening that weren't happening years prior started happening and it started to really take a toll on me because i have adhd and i'm um diagnosed as bipolar so um, that was the start of it. So then now the next, you know, five years of doing ride share, um, with a year and a half off with the nightclub I had, 
up and down because one week I'm making five hundred dollars to six hundred and like forty hours, and then the next week, you know, I make fifteen hundred dollars in in forty or fifty hours. Then the next week I might do fifty, sixty hours, only make eight hundred dollars, and then so it's it causes you to like um, anticipate a certain amount, the you know, lowest number. And you don't hit that and it causes you to panic and rethink your life choices. And this happens every single almost day because it's almost like a gamble for me because, yes. you know, I just want to go and I want to get a guarantee. If I work 10 hours, I want to get a guarantee and I'm happy with, with $200. That's enough to put gas in. I made $17, $18 an hour. I'm happy with that right now. But half of the time you might work 10 hours now and make $60. Um, so the problem I face is, um, it causes me to be, you know, emotional in regards to the work. I never, I don't like to be emotional. I like to be fact driven. Like, do you do this? You're going to win. But now it's like, you can, you can, I, I literally, those two months I had in September and August, I made 10,000 each month. I didn't tell anybody because I was, um, you know, making the money. But then when I hit the numbers, I told people, Hey, this is why I wasn't showing you guys because, you know, with YouTube, um, included and with the hours I was putting in, I was sleeping in the car at one point just to work more hours. I, I was able to achieve those numbers. I was worried about yeah, that, brother. Yeah, I did a 24 hour live and I made on that 24 hour live 360 on um the um, hours worked. And then I made another 350 plus on super chats. So the whole point of the matter was that was a $700 a day um, just off that. So it was a high. But then the week after the last week of the $10,000 each month, the next week, I worked literally sixty hours. I made maybe eight hundred dollars before gas. Okay, so and I did that. You know, let's let's talk about a couple of things you just said. So you talked about about the psychologist. Absolutely, you can clearly see in their marketing and advertising for uh, gig labor that they are using many different incentives and lies to suck people in now once people get in there's a couple things that happen that will affect anybody's mental health and i spent gosh even when i started which is now almost three years ago right uh there were people on youtube doing videos about the gig apps and so the first thing i did before i even went out and and tried it for the first time is i watched a few videos and i've been watching these content creators on youtube since that time and particularly over the last year when i've been working on this book and i have watched every single one of these dignified content creators melt down into a basket case on film well well they they tell you about it and it's terribly sad because there's two things going on here that address both of the things that happen to you. Number one, it's gaslighting. You're not in a real right. world, right? You're in this singularity. So you believe that you're in a market where you can wake up and you know that the sun's gonna be in the sky and then at night the sun's gonna go down, but you're not in that world. You're not in that world mm -hmm. anymore. You wake up and the sun's down and then you go to bed and the sun comes up and all of a sudden you don't know which ends up because you're being gaslighted. You are being your expectations are being used against you, and then they're ultimately used against you by intermittent reinforcement. The intermittent reinforcement is one of the most powerful aspects of human psychology. If you give a human being a reward occasionally, it's actually more, and occasionally, but also randomly, they don't know when it's coming. It's more powerful than consistent rewards, okay? And when you're a corporation, since you don't want to give the mouse a bite of cheese every day because cheese is expensive, you can give the mouse a bite of cheese every third day. And that mouse is on day one, it's going to go check the spot for the cheese and it's not there. And the second day it's going to check again. Right. And the third day that mouse's little, little, uh, little brain is all firing because it gets that piece of cheese. Now the next two or three days come again and that's a depressed little mouse because it keeps going back to that spot looking for its reinforcement. Yeah. Now it gets it again. And so what it's doing is it's taking you on this mental up and down and it is conditioning you and your brain to, to, to look for these, these intermittent reinforcements instead of consistent stream of, of the only reinforcement that we should care about in a job, which is money. Right. And so yep. they did a bait and switch on us. All of a sudden, we're not measuring our success by money anymore. 
we're measuring our success by, well, I had a good week and this is a bad week, but I'm going to have a good week next week. And what did it do? Yep. It, took, it took you who had a gambling addiction and it forced yep. you into it, into what I called forced gambling. Because, because yeah. really the, the gig apps are forced gambling. You're gambling with your time. You're gambling with the risk yeah. of your vehicle and your labor. You're gambling at the end of the day that somehow you're going to come out better than you went into it. And that's just not the case anymore. Okay. There's a lot of people that are literally losing money by the time they go do gig work and they pay for their gas and expenses, maybe some damage to their car, the, the time away. And then there's opportunity cost as well. Right. Any yeah. of us that are out doing gig work, should we have the opportunity, could be doing work at a wage. And so when you're out there doing gig work and you're sitting in a parking lot, make, not making a penny for an hour waiting for your gig app to ding, that's at an opportunity cost. You could be spending that with your kids. You could be spending that with your partner. You could be out taking a walk. You could be taking a nap. You could be doing a million other things. But instead, you're sitting there with your cell phone in a parking lot at the ready for free for corporate America and using your own assets. Yep. If that's not the biggest scam in the history of humanity, you tell me what is. Like this is this is slavery, but they're getting us to volunteer for it. And and yeah, it ain't gonna it ain't really gonna change either until you know. I have to cut you off here. I'll just say, um, so to touch on that, um, you pretty much have. Like most of my, you know, subscribers, you know, a lot of the reason why I even have subscribers because we've all been going through this, you know, now for the past year. Now, I'm going to ask you, don't you think that things have really drastically dropped and dipped the past year with what you've seen with, I mentioned um, my last video, Moochie Moo, a Moochie Moo. Um, right. I used to watch him. He's the most happy, positive. He has like a high tone voice. He's like, hey guys, how you doing? <laughs> Not anymore. Not and, anymore. like, it seems like it's World War Three to where you have people like um, the, the, the right, um, Dashing, or not Dashing Trader, um, he's actually on the, the Wit of Rebels, but then you have, like, the corporate's um, uh, DoorDash Diaries. Um, he's pushing new people on. He's pretty much exploiting people to exploit more of their time, money, the resources to these apps. But then you have people like Dashing Trader who's actually trying to make a change. He's actually hit the news. Um, you have a bunch of other subscribers who've been able to get media coverage based on us being exploited. So don't you think it's been really terrible to pass like year to the point of things are going to change or do you think it's still not going to change? They're not going to change and I'll tell you why. So you're, you're 100 percent right on the economy and you're 100 percent right on the on the earnings and the system. But here's the problem. When you look at the national media and the economics of the situation, and you look at the CEOs of DoorDash and Uber and Lyft, they will tell you that this economic downturn produces a lower level of capital investment from investors. And so it causes unemployment. So there's more gig workers available. And as DoorDash said in their Q3 earnings announcement, they have a surplus of gig app labor, a surplus of dashers now, where in 2021, they were short of dashers and they recognized they had to pay dashers more than they wanted to because there was a shortage. And they also recognized that since there's not a shortage anymore, they can now ratchet those wages down. So again, they, they kind of think we're really stupid. They think they can talk to the financial sector and, and they think they can talk about data science and that us little grunt laborers aren't smart enough to figure out that we're, that we're being screwed. And, and we are figuring out that, that we're being systematically screwed. But the system is happening right now where there is a surplus of people looking for work. And so this is a boom for the gig app economy in terms of getting gig app workers and the more there are the less they pay them right and then some of the people with higher expectations that have been doing this for a while drop out the new people come in that are easier to fool easier to manipulate um it, it, right now in the united states i think there's an estimate of somewhere around 10 million gig app workers give give or take doordash claims somewhere around 4 million dashers right now. 
and I don't really know how many Uber and Lyft claim. And there's also crossover, right? There's people that, that multi-app and they're on multiple different platforms. But, but the problem is, is that the, this economy is leading to more labor being available and that's giving the gig app companies the opportunity to take further advantage of that labor and ratchet the wages down. So it's absolutely happening. It's absolutely intentional. And it's absolutely going to affect the lives, the lives, the lifestyle, and the mental health of the people doing that work. And again, you know, you watch, you talked about Mushimu, who is kind of an affable guy who does videos virtually every single day. I mean, we're talking probably six, seven days a week, most weeks. And you can watch him, you can watch these other folks just, just melt down, just be gaslighted, just be frustrated, be depressed, question their lives, question the decisions, be coerced into taking orders and contracts that they wouldn't take otherwise because they get desperate, right? And, and so this is all feeding on desperation, all of it. It's disgusting, it's vile. It's, it's inhumane. I mean, these, like you said, this, this, is, this is one of the great abuses of mankind. And it's either going to continue to get worse and it's going to become the standard as we become slaves or somehow we're going to stop making ourselves available to this system. And, you know, maybe our legislators or our, or our regulators will grow a spine, but that's that's just really unlikely, right? They let this gig economy develop and they're being paid handsomely to let it uh, exist. So there's gonna come a time where it's gonna break because the system is not economically viable, right? It's just not. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but again, you wanna look at the, the people who founded these companies cashed out as billionaires. So do they care? They, they really don't, no. right? They've, they've made their money off this, off this scheme. And there's, a there's another bias. There's a status quo bias. We think because the gig economy exists today and because millions of people have been earning money on the gig economy, good, bad, or indifferent, the status quo is, well, okay, it's here, it's okay, let's do it. It's the system. We got to work with it. We got to do what we can do. Status quo bias is a damn ugly bias when you're getting screwed, right? And so yeah. we may want to question our society and question our system. Is it, it's, it's unlikely that our leaders are going to do that for us. They're, they're not showing us that, they're, that they care about labor. And uh, we're we're at a turning we're we're at a turning point for humanity. This is this is a very very serious threat to our existence and to our freedom. And anybody that thinks it's not needs to read a little bit about AI and learn learn a little bit about the power of what can happen in a gig app. And what I've what I've written and what I will say here is that with the DoorDash application, any unscrupulous government or dictator or corporation could run a labor force of a company or an entire nation as slaves. That's how powerful it is. And it's more than just testing a whole bunch of it. Automatic testing is built into the system. So those 6 million predictions are also testing you. It's going to test you every day, Dennis, to see what's the lowest that Dennis will take. Oh, he'll take this low. Let's try him tomorrow. Let's try him tomorrow. Let's try him tomorrow. And it's going to ratchet you down, Dennis. And it's going to ratchet me down in a different way by what I accept and where I live and where I work. So this, this system's capability is so far beyond what we've ever thought of in terms of control from management or a company that it's really hard to conceptualize. And that's one of my challenges in writing this book is that to understand the gig economy and to understand gig apps and data science and artificial intelligence, you have to look at the world in a different way. It's not the world with gravity and the sun rising and clouds in the sky and air to breathe that you're thinking of. It's a oh, yeah. different world. And until you accept that, you're going to be a victim. If you accept it and you decide to do gig apps, then you've given then you have informed consent you know you're being gamed you know you're gambling yeah. you know you're taking your chances you know you have expenses you know you have at risk and so 
like any other human endeavor, if you decide you want to work for artificial intelligence employer in a gig app economy, I'm fine with that. But I want you to know what you're doing. I want you to know how you're being gamed, that you're being gamed, that you're in a system and that you're choosing to be in that system. Right. And, and that's really the crux of it is that the deception alone is just unacceptable. Right. The deception is so profound as to be criminal. Yeah. Let me um, um, let me address one way real quick that um, I didn't realize this until I saw Mushi Mu's video and I saw him so depressed um, that I realized I saw myself in him. And I was going to do a video earlier and talk about the fact that his his I see why people are cussing me out, telling me to do something about the struggle that I'm dealing with with these rideshare companies, because I, I mean, I, I felt that energy. It was just energy that I just feel bad for the guy. And if I told him to go get a skill or go get a, you know, a, a job. Like he would think I'm hating on him, but in reality, I'm I feel for him because this isn't ever gonna change. But let me tell you something that just happened to me. So Christmas, um, Chris, two weeks before Christmas, I went and I got this car, um, this new car because and I'm I'm actually doing a lease um, for it. But long story short, um, somebody stole a uh, part from the bottom of the car I was renting, so I didn't have a car for a couple of days. So I was in the process of switching my license over to California. So Lyft deactivated my account for almost three weeks because they had to do a background check that was delayed and they didn't understand new license, no driving record. It's going to take forever to get switched over. So I couldn't do Lyft. So then Spark app was down like probably about a week out of the two weeks before Christmas because they had system issues. So you weren't really in delivery. So then DoorDash, they were um, what um, Dash and Trader doesn't really like this. I'm not Dash and Trader. I keep mixing two because he's, he's like – we're on the same team against um, DoorDash Diaries. What right. he just, didn't want to address clarify, is... Just to clarify real quick that? for the viewers. Yep. So when, when, he, when he talks about DoorDash Diaries, so DoorDash has made a practice of reaching out to a lot of YouTube content creators and offering them sponsorships. So, you know, the, the details of that are not particularly clear to me, but there are a number of YouTube content creators that are open about the fact that they are sponsored in some manner by DoorDash. And so that's that's what you're referring to, Dennis, is people that actually have, oh, yeah. in, in terms of DoorDash Diaries, a, a formal connection to the corporations. Yeah, so pretty much, yeah, they have formal connections, so they're able to, to they can make things change. They can make a change if they wanted to. So this is what, what was going on. With DoorDash, you have to be a top dasher to drive any time. Now, right now, it shows that it's busy all over, you know, LA, you know, California area. This is normally not like this, but Saturday, maybe Sunday for like a couple hours. Now, what happens is if I click on one of these, um, it will, like the way this, this market is set up, if I click on one of these cities, the delivery is going to take me to another city. So now I got to drive back to like maybe two miles back into the next, the next city or suburb over to get back to getting orders. So they don't add that extra time to get back to the original city on the um, delivery um, estimate of mileage. So what's happening was I only had DoorDash and Grubhub to work with because Spark was down. So I was dealing with, um, I had one good week, um, end of December, that I was able to hit, you know, $22, $23 an hour. But this is after not driving DoorDash for months. So I go back to now driving DoorDash, and I was dealing with them trying to brainwash me into being a top dash here by making this great. This is great out um, the whole um, Christmas break and in the first week of January grayed out because I wasn't top dasher. But then you have certain times now, maybe I say 15 hours a week total in LA, busiest city, uh, one of the busiest cities in the country, that unless you decide to take um, orders that will ultimately keep you at 12 to $13 an hour max before gas, you can't drive DoorDash. So they sucker people who are desperate, such as me, because at the time I was desperate, into working for minimum wage um, rates to make money. Yeah. So it's, that's, it's, that's one of the things that, you know, I'm battling with um, DoorDash Diaries to get him to understand that he's trying to put out these videos talking about be your own boss and, and you know, you, you want to work a nine to five. But in reality, you're better off. I'm better off working a nine to five right now, which is what I'm about to do while I'm you know, going back to school because of um, videos from DoorDash. Di I'm sorry. He's. That's, um, yeah, DoorDash Diaries and a couple other YouTubers who still were selling that dream of making 
thirty dollars an hour, but I'm doing it the wrong way. I'm doing everything that they said. But now after seeing Mushimu and a few other legit streamers, um, I've realized everybody's dealing with this right now. Mm-hmm. And let's answer some of these questions real quick before we get too far behind. If you want to uh, address, yeah, yeah. So I, I this- see Project Project Hallway TV said next year the base pay will be a dollar fifteen. Um, so that's a, that's a really interesting point because so DoorDash DoorDash games us in a number of ways. Okay, so I want to use a, a, an example with you. If I tell you that I'm going to give you ten dollars, you don't care if I take nine one dollar bills out of my right pocket and one dollar bill out of my left pocket and give it to you, do you? Right, that's ten dollars. Right? And if yeah. I give you if I give you a five from my right pocket and a five from my left back pocket, that's still 10 bucks. Right. And then I could give you, I could give you a $10 bill. It's all $10. So the only thing that matters to anyone doing a job is the gross pay. And so what DoorDash in particular has done is they have broken this down deceptively so that they can use intermittent reinforcement. They can surprise you every once in a while and give you a bonus and get you all excited so you keep going, right? They don't give you the full information. They give you base pay, which is shit, right? It's what, $2, $2.25, $2.50. It doesn't matter. It's garbage, right? And then they allege that there's a tip that will make up more money, but it's not a tip, right? In an inorganic market that's being gamed, nothing is real, right? This tip is being prompted to each different consumer. It's being prompted based upon whether that consumer is a subscriber, whether that consumer is a regular order, everything else. And these orders are being served specifically to you in order to give you the target amount that the computer AI is going to allow you to make, right? And so what is gaslighting all of these folks online and causing all this social dissent is that they've convinced dashers that this tip amount is key to their income and that when consumers don't tip, yeah, bad luck on them. They just didn't make as much. Well, that's that's really garbage, isn't it? Because the only thing that matters is how much somebody's paid. If you game their tip back and forth to play games with them, it doesn't change that gross pay. And so so they've got they've set up a system where YouTube content creators and and dashers and these deactivations come. Because dashers are angry at consumers and lashing out verbally to consumers, sometimes even in person, because they consider consumers disrespectful for not tipping them. But wait a minute. Let's take a step back. What system are they in? They're in a complete isolated economic system of DoorDash. DoorDash controls every single penny they earn. Every single penny. The customer has nothing to do with it because they're being served an amount of income that DoorDash has dictated to serve them. And so it's this mind game that's being played. And in this mind game, they're actually turning the people against each other, which is one of the grossest, most insidious, sickening things that I've seen is the hatred that it brings. And then the consumers respond by saying, well, these DoorDash drivers are a bunch of jerks. And they work for DoorDash, so they should be making their money from DoorDash, which isn't, by the way, totally wrong. But they don't know that we don't really work for DoorDash, right? DoorDash has no drivers. DoorDash doesn't even know us. In fact, DoorDash has gone to the ends of the earth to make sure that they have no connection to the dashers that actually do the work, right? They the, the, The support is an independent contractor. Payroll is an independent contractor. Services, you can't talk to DoorDash. DoorDash does not functionally exist if you're a consumer or a DoorDasher or even in, re- uh, well, restaurants have like special service or merchants have special service. Oh, yeah. 
because they're the key to the revenue. But, but DoorDash does not exist as a customer service entity. It's all farmed out. It's all put in the hands of people with no empowerment, no decision-making ability whatsoever. And so, so what they're giving us is a broken social system, a system that turns the people against each other while a corporation skims the money. And then let's, let's take a step back to these earnings again, because I'm going to question even yeah. every dollar of earning that you say that you've had. Because a key element of any business is called risk, right? Risk reward, right? You know this in investing. So if you're going to take a high right. risk, you want a higher reward. And if you're taking a really low risk, you expect a lower reward, okay? But what they're doing to these independent contractors is they're giving us 100% of the risk. Your risk of sitting in the parking lot making $0, that's all yours. If somebody crashes into your car, that's on you. If, if you... Uh, don't make any money and you drive a whole bunch of miles and you end up learning, losing money on the day, that's on you. If the price of gas yeah. goes up over five bucks, that's on you. If inflation goes up and all of a sudden your eggs cost five bucks, DoorDash is making more income, your uh, disposable income for your family is going down, that's on you. And so even the amount of money that people think they're earning is in jeopardy. Because I can tell you for myself, that I probably cost myself in maintenance and damage to my car over the 40,000 miles I drove for DoorDash, my estimate's about eight grand uh, that I would subtract out from my relatively meager earnings. And that's a lot of risk. And if you have a mechanical problem or if your car gets dinged or if you have to take it into the shop and they don't have the parts, guess what? You're out of work. And guess what else? If DoorDash decides that they want to inactivate you or deactivate you for any reason or no reason whatsoever, you have no recourse, right? This isn't a job. There isn't, you have more security going out and picking up recan, cans to recycle and return for a bottle deposit than you have from DoorDash, right? It's just, there's nothing here other than an illusion and a scam to abuse labor. Mm, yep. And so, I, I'll tell you this. No, go ahead. No, go ahead. You can oh, finish. I was just, I was say, so, so when we talk about, when we talk about base pay or tips, it's just all garbage pay. Yeah. Right. I don't care how I get $10. If it all comes $10 from DoorDash, doesn't matter. If, if it's $9.99 from the customer and one cent from DoorDash, doesn't matter. It's 10 bucks. DoorDash yeah. knows that. DoorDash knows the only thing that matters is your gross income. You don't get a paycheck from your, your job at the car wash and go like, oh, well, this was for lunchtime. And then this part was for the first half of the day. And this part, because it's a job. You're being paid to do a job. Right? In the gig economy, they're, they're paying you by the hour, but for a minute at a time. Right? So they're going to utilize... 15 minutes out of your hour and we'll pay you for that 15 minutes. Now the other 45 that you're sitting on your ass making nothing, not our problem. You're not our employee. So, so this is just the, the highest jeopardy, most gambling centric system possible. And again, it's a trap. It is absolutely nothing but a trap. You're going to run your car into the ground. You're going to have accidents. There's risk. Things are going to happen every single day, and it's all on you. If the restaurant's a half hour late, guess who's eating that? You, not DoorDash, not the corporation making, you know, billions and billions of dollars. You, you're the one that's going to pay for the fact that the Mexican restaurant is 30 minutes late on the burrito. That sucks, man. That's, that's a pretty shitty thing to do to somebody that's already in poverty, isn't it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so, you know, and, and all of that, by the way, is out of your control. All of that risk is yeah. out of your control. You don't know. None of us know. And by the way, since they don't give us the full information of the mileage that we're driving or the location that we're driving to or the return trip or anything else, we know even less than we think we know. I mean, it's, yeah. it's literally an unsolvable equation that they give you a 60 second timer to accept or not. It's absurd. Oh, yeah. It's ridiculous. Oh, absolutely. And people, are they like, they're liking your takes here um, in regards to uh, the gig economy. So I'll, I'll, um,
So next one is going to be a two part question. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's, let's, let's start it off by um, highlighting a comment that um, Sin um, mentioned. He said, Dash and Trader really sent shockwaves through corporate. Now, do you know who Dash and, Tr Dash and Trader is? I do. Are you familiar with? It? Okay. Mm -hmm. Have you seen one of the videos confronting customers? Uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, and it's, okay. it's, now, it's now, not now, a good thing. Let me, <laughs> but let me. Let, yeah, but here, we're gonna we're gonna address we're gonna address that. Um, are you able on a video side? Um, would you get copyright strike if we po uh, we do a um, thirty second video just so people in the chat can see what we're gonna talk about here? This is a big topic right now. I don't think I so. I mean, I, I'm not. Okay. Like, you're, we're putting on a your YouTube you your YouTube channel, man. Oh yeah, yeah. You can because we're um gonna do. I just want people to to see what we're. Can you hear that? Uh, nothing yet. Moment, let's see. I think this is one of his videos confronting a passenger. Oh, let's see. Well, I don't, don't I have any. Yeah, I know a lot of people um trying to do it from my computer That's, here. Even, even what you're showing is enough. I mean, it's showing the guy's face and his wrinkled yes, brow. Yes, sir. Welcome back to the channel. I'm your boy today. Oh, can you see Tyler, that? And we about to yep. see why they ordered food and it's negative 15 and they don't know how to tip. So, I like drivers don't make no money when miserable ass people bag their tip not a freaking a fucking sandwich so you guys get the point that's what he was doing now let me let me give you my opinion on that and then you can um go ahead and take take the lead here because i want to i want to i want to also address you know that's pretty much what he he does i love it um but then let's add this to his videos um this comment only waiters and bartenders deserve tips in my opinion um, someone dropping off um, a burger and fries should, shouldn't be crying about tips. So now um, we're going to compare both of these um, these um, situations. So first thing is first, first thing first, um, the tipping culture. Um, you know, um, I'm pretty sure you're older. I'm old. I'm 36. We know back in our day, you respected service industry. So if anybody was performing a service you can do for yourself, then you tipped. Unless you're elderly and you just can't do it because you're not able to do it, then you don't have to tip. Tip 50 cent. But if you are able to walk to that store, get your own food, you can you know, walk to McDonald's because there's McDonald's every corner now, um, do it. But if you want somebody to do that service for you, you should tip. But now this generation, um, the fact that they don't make as much as generations prior, they're trying to take away the responsibility of tips, which is why when I drove taxi in Vegas, um, in 14, 2014, 15, um, you had drivers who used to be, get angry um, at the fact that, you know, they pick up stereotypes, okay? Mm -hmm. It's usually the white married woman. You don't want her in your car because she's going to, you know, not tip. And then you have, like, usually Asian people from China because they don't tip over there. And, you know, you had even stereotypes on us. So yeah, here's yeah. situation. Racism, brother. I'm glad it's you, not me. I'm just kidding. Yeah. No, no, it is. You got you to gotta, gotta have a little racism in this just to, just to get the algorithm up. But the reason why I mentioned that. In Oregon t-shirts, tip. Yeah. No, but the reason why I mentioned that, let me tell you, the reason why I mentioned that is to say that you have um, people who you used to get stereotyped as somebody that's not going to tip. Now you have a culture to where now everybody is, you assume everybody's not going to tip. It doesn't matter race gender nothing you but back in the day you used to have you knew who weren't going to tip Cause remember i was joe taxi so you knew because you got used to not getting tipped by certain people so as you can see the views go up because for some reason when i start talking about a little race the views go up because the algorithm but back to the point at hand the reason why i like what dash and trader is doing is because he's bringing light to these people who i get it doordash is charging you high fees but it's a luxury service you're paying for you should not be expecting somebody to drive eight miles from your house in the snow in freaking five degree weather and not think to give them at least a two dollar tip. And then you get mad if somebody does drop off your food for, you know, the base pay of 250. You give them a bad rating because it took two hours to get your food. So that's the reason why I like what he's doing, because he's bringing awareness to where people are getting back to the point of tipping. You tip service. You get good service, you tip. Don't act like you're going to tip, and then we, you get out of my car when I'm doing lift. You get out of my car. You say, hey, I'm going to give you a nice tip, man. You got me here safe, fast, and quick. You know, I get people who literally take five minutes to come outside. They'll come out like, oh, I'm running late to work. Like I had a, a woman who, I'll tell you this, and then give me your feedback. I had a woman who literally 
um, left her phone in the back seat of my car. So she calls me, and my next pickup was around the corner. So I go to pick up this woman, and she's she takes five minutes to get out the house. But I call her like, hey, you know, I got to drop off this phone. Um, I might have to cancel because, you know, I'm running behind on time. Because I don't like waiting more than six, seven minutes. She comes running outside. She gets in the car. I'm like, hey, do you mind if I go around the corner to drop off this phone? The woman just left. Um, no, I, I'm running late to work. So you kind of need to get me straight there. If you can go to the left instead of the right. The left took me. I was stuck between three lights when I could have went to the right. Threw the phone out the window to the to the girl who dropped, left her phone in my car. And I could have kept it moving because it was a residential street. So long story short, I drop off the woman who I got her to a job 10 minutes early. She's like, oh, my God, thank you. I appreciate it. You got me here early. I'm like, bro, she didn't leave me, no, leave me no tip. And she wanted me to rush her to work. And she took six minutes to come outside. Then the, set, the first woman who left her phone in the car, she didn't even give me a tip. And I brought her phone back. And I didn't hit her with the um, return fee. So that's what I mean by people being entitled to not tip for good service. Now, you give me your feedback on, you know, Dash and Trader and then, um, on people not tipping at all. So let's let's differentiate first. So what is tip? When we think of a tip, we think of the world that we know, right? So we think of, I go to the coffee shop, I order a piece of pie and a cup of coffee, and I leave the, the waitress a, a $2 tip on the $6 bill, and I feel good, it's 33% tip, she's happy, everything else, right? because she smiled at me and she poured my coffee. And when I was all done and ready to go home, I was satisfied with my experience and I took off. Okay, there's, that's, that's a tip as we know it. Here's another kind of a tip. Another kind of a tip is you get in a taxi cab and you say, I wanna go to 32nd Street and Lexington in New York and the taxi cab takes you there and you put in your card and you go, hey, that was a nice chat. Thanks for the ride. And you give the guy a $5 tip on a $25 fare and you feel good about yourself. Okay. All seems reasonable, right? Now, in rideshare, that's a lot like cab, isn't it? Right? I get in your rideshare card, Dennis. I maybe have a chat with you. I think you're polite. You offer me a thing of water. I see your smiling face and we have a nice time. We get where we're going and I think you're a good, safe driver and I can give you a tip when I'm done, okay? There's another tip. Now here's where it all breaks down by human psychology. And DoorDash knows this, by the way. DoorDash's tipping system is broken. And because it is broken intentionally, bastardized intentionally, the behavior of dashing trader in confronting people is is really reprehensible and ill-advised, especially in this world today where somebody might just whip out a gun and put a cap in your ass, yep. right? It's a very hazardous thing to do on many, many, many levels, in addition to being really questionable ethically because although you think that that customer understands the plight of a DoorDash dasher, they do not, okay? They were in an app, they were ordering their food, and in the DoorDash app, your anonymous, no smiling face, no Dennis, no Jeff, right? The stand-in, if you look in the DoorDash app, is a alleged Japanese pro bike racer named Hero U Dot, and he DoorDashes for fun because he wants to be a pro bike racer. So that's that's how DoorDash represents a DoorDasher in their app. And don't think that that doesn't make a difference. It's not your face. It's not my face like in Uber or Lyft. It's anonymous. Second of all, the way that the tip happens on a horribly overpriced order. So now I'm suffering, stick, suffering sticker shock on the 20% uh, markup on my, on my order by the time I'm done. 15% and then another fee. So I'm already in sticker shock. And then the last screen I have, the only thing standing between my food and an order is it says tip your driver and it gives a prompted amount. OK, so now Dashing Trader is assuming that these people that he's confronting have the agency to choose a different amount, the knowledge to choose a different amount 
the knowledge of DoorDash to choose a different amount, the knowledge of your plight, my plight, anybody's plight, they don't. Okay. They say three options, they get three options, $2, $3 and $4. And they're probably going to choose the middle one if they choose any at all. Okay. They could go to another screen and enter a custom amount, but you can guess how many people do that. That's not consumer behavior in an app. Right. So you're giving, you're giving agency for somebody tipping because you're thinking of the coffee shop or the porter at the airport or mm, yeah. uh, or the ride share, that's not yeah. DoorDash. Again, we're not yeah. in a world with sunshine and night and day and gravity. We're in DoorDash. Yeah. So that's one of the problems, okay? So the other problem is there are psychological studies, which by the way, are in my book and, and on my Twitter feed, if you'd like to read about them, that absolutely show that prompting a customer, even in a human situation where we can look each other in the face, prompting each other, uh, a customer for a tip prior to service, prior to getting your food, maybe even a half hour, 45 minutes, an hour before getting your food, you're asked to tip this driver. That is seen by customers as both deceptive and unfair. Okay. So this is what we call a setup. Man, this is a corporate setup to get us poor bastards that are stupid enough to order food off the DoorDash app or stupid enough to work for DoorDash. And I'm yeah. counting myself. Yeah, It's taking us for a ride because we're thinking again of this organic world that we know and live in. And that is not the DoorDash world. So what Dashing Trader is doing is confronting people that have no ability to know or do differently. And that makes it both morally wrong and technically incorrect right and then if we go to the psychological step that we know that they're undermining even the concept of a tip by making it happen both anonymously and before the service is provided come on man we are digging a hole so fucking deep that it can't even be seen anymore okay so when when people are talking about these you know there's a guy named pedro doordash santiago who's been doing this oh, yeah. for a long time has a big channel he's very popular and he loves to take pride in calling uh what he calls no tippers he calls them miserable clowns they're miserable human beings and he says it over and over again as do other people and that really bothers me because number one guess what they're getting food delivered to their freaking front door. They're not miserable. You're miserable. <laughs> They're going to have a goddamn good meal. Okay. So Pedro is very, very wrong about how miserable they are. What we're hold doing. On, hold on. Wait, 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 wait. Let me, let me not to cut you off. Um, just if any of them come in the comments, I'm just telling you, this might be a good time to see. They have wanted somebody brave enough to rebut their, their approach. And nobody's brave enough. Like Dash and Trader. He wanted to talk to um, DoorDash Diaries because he uh, disagrees and he openly disagrees. You're the first one because Dash and Trader might be still in the chat if he's not working. But you're the first one that I've seen um, disagree strongly with what he's doing, who probably be brave enough to actually talk to him. Because nobody, nobody, everybody goes in the comments and says what they feel, say what they feel. They don't have faces on their, you know, on their profile. You're the first one that I've seen that, I, like I said, I support them. But you're literally the first one that's brave enough to put your face on screen and actually be willing to have that conversation. So maybe in the future, he might be somebody that, you know, had a conversation with since you disagree because I, I, everybody else is scared to have it with him. You no, know, I'd, I'd love to have the conversation and I write about it in the book and I talk about it on the podcast. This is this is actually, I think, one of the most disturbing parts of DoorDash. And and why do I why did I focus on DoorDash in the book Full Dash Closure? It's because DoorDash is the market gorilla worldwide. They have 60 percent of the market. Yeah, there's Grubhub out there. There's Uber Eats. There's there's other stuff. But it just doesn't matter. DoorDash is setting this pace. DoorDash is the world leader in deceptive data science and AI technology in a way it can only be because it doesn't carry humans around, right? Rideshare carries humans around. So it ties rideshare to a human experience. DoorDash is not a human experience in any way, shape or form. And so again, when we look at the psychology and I know, you know, Dash and Trader doesn't know this. I didn't know this before I spent eight months researching the fact. 
he doesn't know the fact that tipping behavior is biased by when you ask for the tip, how you ask for the tip, where you ask for the tip, is there personal interaction, right? There are too many factors against it. And let me tell you something. If every one of the 4 million dashers today went out and started screaming, it would change tipping behavior of America none, okay? We are pissing in the wind, we're spitting in the wind. And all it's doing is coming back and getting all over our pants and our face, okay? And that's what Jackson Trader is doing. He's humiliating himself, he's humiliating other people, and he's pitting people against each other, not because he's a bad guy, he's got good intentions. And I know Pedro does too. Right. They want respect. They want respect for their for their fellow dashers. They want respect for their fellow gig workers. And I support that 100 percent. But respect comes from proper pay from the corporation, not from fleeced customers that are already grossly overpaying for their merchandise and interacting in an app where they don't know the rules. OK, so this is what we call scapegoating. Right. We're scapegoating customers and we're encouraged to do that by the press and media that constantly put out these stories about confronting customers and about customers Wait. saying how their DoorDasher sucks, right? They love it when the people fight against each other because what are we not doing when we're fighting against each other? We're not pointing out the fact that DoorDash pays sub-minimum wage and takes advantage of poor people and takes advantage of the most vulnerable labor in the world and in the United States. So I strongly, strongly, strongly implore every single dasher to get off this damn tip idea and start talking about what their total pay is because that's what DoorDash controls. It's, DoorDash it's no it's, controls total pay. Yeah, it's no tip, no trick. But here's the thing: I got to push back a little bit because they're not on here yet. But let me ask you this: If you go to um, Outback and you get a steak. No, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Just ask this it's question. You go to Outback. No, 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 no. You got no. You got it. Okay, it it's going to cor. It's going to correlate. It's going to correlate. It's going to correlate. So if you go to Outback and you get a steak and baked potato, you know, and you get your drink, mm-hmm. how much is that meal going to cost normally? Without the tip, how much is that meal going to cost? Thirty dollars. What was that? Okay. $30. So if you go to go to uh, if you go to the best, if you go to Giant Eagle or whatever you know um, store you have, um, major store. A grocery store, how much is that same meal going to cost if you make it yourself? Five dollars, seven dollars, eight dollars. Yeah, so you're paying an extra twenty-two dollars to get that experience of being in a restaurant, having a hopefully attractive woman, or if you're, you know, attractive male host or whatever, um, you're paying for that. You know, just like you go to Hooters. So here's the situation: you <laughs> are paying a markup with DoorDash to get somebody to bring you your food. You don't have to pay that. You can literally make your own steak, your own baked potato at home. So here's the thing. You should not be not tipping. You should never not tip your your delivery driver because guess what? 20 years ago, it was frowned upon at a restaurant. If you're a server, you know what you call people that don't tip. You call them miserable clown human beings because don't come to the restaurant if you can't afford to tip because that's the way America is. You get paid based on performance. And if you get a speeding ticket to get somebody their, their food hot because it's a catering order, and you get a speeding ticket on the way, that's what you're supposed to do. But if you don't tip that person at speed, you're a clown and you're miserable because ultimately this is a new generational thing to where these kids don't make as much because they don't work as hard as generations before. And with inflation, they're not making as much as generations before to where they can't afford tips. So they're making up all these excuses to not tip um, because of the fact they don't want to tip because they don't want to give away money. They're looking at it. They're looking at it like, I don't have the tip, so why should I come out of my pocket ten extra dollars or fifteen extra dollars when I can walk out of this restaurant and use that fifteen dollars to buy a couple games on the Apple Store on the App Store? So that's my thought on that. All right. So number one, your example is in the physical world that we know, right? So you're violating yeah. you're violating the DoorDash alternate reality. Number one. Okay. Yeah. So, but fair fair enough. Okay. So let's let's go with your let's go with your tip concept of. You're getting a service, and when you get service, you give a tip. But here's the problem. It's not no tip, no trip, right? Over half the customers don't put a tip, and they get the trip. Yeah, okay. so, so, again, we're pissing in the wind, and we're speaking to ourselves. We're, we're convincing nobody. The people that are going to tip are going to tip, and the people that aren't going to tip are still going to get their food. Okay, so number one, we have no control over no tip, no trip. And so starting a campaign – 
when you have no control over the outcome whatsoever is a really, really bad idea. It's a, it's a way to be very disappointed in your outcome, number one. Okay, yeah. number two, in the DoorDash system, how do they sucker in the consumer? They sucker in the consumer, we've all seen it, with $25 off your first order, free delivery, yep. subscribe to Dash Pass, discount, 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 discount. So DoorDash is setting the expectation of the consumer, and a lot of these orders are coming with discounts, that they're getting a bargain, right? And so when people are ordering a bargain over the internet, how excited do you think they are to tip when they're getting $0 delivery? What's a tip on $0? I don't know. It doesn't seem like I should be giving a tip. They said $0 delivery. So DoorDash, exactly. again, is setting up a system to fail. Okay, so DoorDash is setting up the expectation of the customer of highly discounted delivery often. And what do they do? They discount the delivery, right? And what part do you get money off? Off the delivery. They don't discount the meal, right? Right? They're discounting, yeah. they're discounting delivery. So you've got that. Then, as they get addicted and bait and switched, they start paying a premium for DoorDash, right? They're paying the 15% markup on already marked up food and a delivery fee on top of that. And so now I'm paying $42.50 for a $30 meal and you want a tip too? So now you want me to pay $47 for my $30 meal. So the sticker shock, who's that falling on, Dennis? It's falling on you. It's falling on the yeah. dash. Now, the final part that is the, the coup de grace, the final, the, final, uh, the final straw, is that DoorDash benefits the lower the tip amounts are. DoorDash wants tips and total pay to be as low as possible because every cent the customer pays decreases the amount that they sell, right? There's, there's an elasticity of demand. So DoorDash is biasing a system to minimize your total pay, which includes tip, because they don't care how the customer is paying. They want the customer to pay as little as possible while they make the most money on the food as possible because they get a percentage of the gross sale. So again, you've got a corporation whose motives are diametrically opposed to you getting a good tip who controls it in the app, who puts it before the service anonymously. So you're connect, you're totally connected with it. And by the way, Dennis, most times now with the pandemic, this is contactless delivery. So I never even have to look you in the eye, right? I say, leave it at my doorstep and I don't answer you. I don't have to look you in the eye and lose my pride of not, of not being a good tipper. And they know that. And then finally to the addiction, we know that although we call it a luxury service, it's really a sewer service. And so a lot of the people that are ordering, I would say more than half, are not really very well healed, uh, wealthy folks, right? They're relatively impoverished folks, just like the people delivering the food. And they might be disabled. They might not be able to drive. They might be stuck at home. They might be jobless. There's a lot of different reasons. But these are not people that have the luxury of throwing in an extra five bucks. They ordered specifically because they thought they could get $20 of food for 12 bucks today. Yeah. Right. And tipping you ain't part of that bargain. So what, I, what I'm trying to tell you is that Every part of the tipping experience in DoorDash diverts from real world practices. And so for Dashers like Pedro or Dash and Trader or anyone else like you and me to hold the customer responsible for the amount of the tip or no tip at all, it's, it, it, again, it's pure scapegoating. You're, you're holding somebody responsible for something that they really don't control. DoorDash controls it all. DoorDash is the only place to work. If you want your $10, get your $10. Don't worry about whether it's coming from a customer tip or from a DoorDash base pay. If you're not getting your 10 bucks, somebody's ripping you off. And who is that ripping you off? It's DoorDash, right? No consumer can rip you off. That's not possible. DoorDash is sending out orders that you're going to lose money on. That's DoorDash's problem. So, That's not a consumer's problem. No, consumers so, okay. are designed to get what they need at the lowest price possible. And yes, they might respect people with a tip,
but Jordash ain't the real world. So we just have a huge problem here. And because this runs so deep and so emotionally, I consider it a very scary diversion from societal stability, right? We have the lower classes fighting against each other while corporations take us to the cleaners. It's ugly. Uh, I highly advise that nobody uh, consider customers culpable for tip amounts. And instead they start looking at themselves in the mirror and looking at DoorDash as a uh, labor provider, I guess, if you want to call them a task provider, because this, this no tip, no trip. First of all, it's not true. Plenty of people are getting their food every day with no tip. So you're just, you just sounding it ridiculous. No, actually, no, if you look at it, you can look up, you can look up on you. You can look up on YouTube. I'll tell you now, you look up on YouTube. There are so many videos of, if you go into a, um, and by the way, I appreciate you even doing this because, you know, as you can see in the comments, you're, you're able to clearly make arguments and points that I haven't had on this channel other than with, you know, Katrina when she comes on, because you guys are able to clearly, you know, direct this, 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 this show here. So I appreciate you being on people. They're enjoying, you know, the conversation here, but, um, yeah, here's the thing. There's a lot of videos from Chipotle and mm -hmm. these different places that the orders stack up and they don't get taken for like, what, an hour or two. And then guess what happens? That the dasher who takes it after, you know, two hours of it sitting around, it goes up to $5 from $2.50. Now they get a bad rating. And that happens too often. And you don't really know until you get to the restaurant, you see the, the sticker and you see how long it sat there. And at that point, if you cancel the order, you know, or an unsigned order, you get, you know, that penalizes you in the long run if you do too many. So yep. there, now if you get a bad rating on top of that, you get a couple of, um, you know, one-star ratings, now you might get penalized because of that. So it's kind of like a tricky situation to where I had, um, just to give you this little side story, I keep it within a minute here so I don't get too off topic. But this guy, um, I used to work for him. He was a uh, professional gambler, okay, in Vegas. I have on my Instagram, he, this guy, it is $36,000 jackpot for him. You know, I walked away with only like $3,600 because we made a deal before we walked in. I got lucky. Now, here's the situation. I don't want no issues with a certain community, but his, his faces and everything is on my Instagram page. But he taught me a valuable lesson that I never experienced before um, from anybody, how to save money. Um, the way he saved money. We would go to a restaurant and we would we would go to like, he wouldn't hold no punches or hold no money back when it comes to eating. So he would spend $50 at the restaurant, $60 at the restaurant every single time. He didn't care. He fed every, everybody that was with him, me, his, his, his nephew, everybody. He would literally only tip $5, no matter how much the total was. Okay. And he used to joke and he used to always say, you know, the, the deadly word, we talked about it often camera but um the j word he's he used to say i'm a j and guess what he would joke because he was like this is why we're rich because we don't give money to unnecessary things i'm the guy that that's broke like living you know paycheck to paycheck and i'm trying to give a 20 25 tip because the chick is hot or this guy gave me great service and he's like he cusses me. If he sees me leave a tip, I got to wait and like say, oh, I forgot my um, my um, phone at the table to give him an extra tip because I got to go back to that place. And I don't want them like these are miserable people who literally ordered a hundred dollars in food and tip five dollars. But he would literally yell at me if I tried to put like for a hundred dollar um, tab, I tried to put a 20 down. He yelled at me because he's like, dude, this is why you're broke. You know, mm -hmm. you have a broke, broke mentality or you think you got to like um, prove people prove a point to people by tipping. So that's what I mean. Like he did it the right way, but they would deem him a miserable human being because he refused to tip. Like if he got towels brought to the room, supposed to give in Vegas $3, $2 at least. He doesn't give nothing. The waitress, I mean, um, you know, the cleaner for the room, he, his room was filthy because he didn't shower, but maybe once every two days. Because even though his room cost stayed the same, he didn't want to use that water because he thought they were charging for excess water. Like, that's how he was. He wanted to save money by any means possible. Yeah, but I had that's the type of person. So, you know what I mean by he calls himself, he says, I'm Jew about everything, pretty much. You know, that's a nasty word you can't really use right now, but it's the, that's. But I told, I made a video on this before, and I'm like, he taught me how to handle money. But guess what? That year that I had with him 
went down the drain because I got back to Youngstown and I got around broke people again to where they got in my mind where I started giving big tips for no reason. Like I can afford it. I started doing, buying stuff that I couldn't afford. And he got me out of that mindset of thinking and caring about what, what people think and what I think is going to make me look cool. He got me out of that mindset. So that's right. the reason why he's not really a miserable human being. He's just smart with his money, but he would be deemed to us YouTube um, YouTube tubers who are on the side of no tip, no trip, a miserable human being. So that's okay. just my thought on that. That's that's the type of customer that, you know, we don't see that side of, of the, you know, of the um, tracks that he just okay. wants to save money. And so, he's a millionaire. He's literally a multimillionaire. And so, so I've seen that a lot. Um, one of the places that I delivered for, for probably a half a year was a community of uh, Hispanic migrant laborers and immigrant Russians. And I can tell you that that community, because they were laborers themselves and valued hard work, always tipped well. Okay. So the point here is that tipping is very cultural. It's very social based upon location, everything else. Okay. So this, this is a little bit of ethnocentrism, right? This is, this is looking at somebody else's culture from the outside and judging them. And one of the ways that I know this is, you know, in my, in my former life in, in the corporate world, I had the opportunity to spend some time in Finland working with Nokia back in the day when, when they actually had a business still, when they were the world leader in, in cell phones and they had a, they had a big thing going. So uh, I took the cab from uh, Helsinki to Espoo, Finland, where the Nokia headquarters was. And it was, I don't know, a 60 euro trip or something. And I put, you know, I'm on the corporate account, right? So I put a good, you know, 15 euro tip on there. And the driver turns around and looks at me and goes, what the hell is this? And he said, well, it's a tip. He goes, no, no. And he crosses it off. He goes, no, we don't, we don't do that. Okay. So yeah. we're all humans, right? So how come the guy in Finland driving the taxi didn't want my tip? Because he didn't like money because he wasn't working? No. It's a different culture, right? Yeah. And so when we go out as human beings and we, we think we understand what's going on in somebody's head, in somebody's day, in somebody's bank account, in somebody's DoorDash order, and we decide to judge and confront them, generally we're an asshole, right? Generally we don't know what the hell we're talking about because they don't know what's in our head and we don't know what's in their head. And so that's one of the problems with, with artificial intelligence and gig app is it confuses our consciousness. We don't know what the world is anymore. We don't know whether we're in the diner where we should tip or we're on the, where we're on the internet, we're getting our bargain for a, of a lifetime and zero dollar food. Okay. Sometimes it's both. And, and so the final, the final straw here is like your friend, the, the rich guy who tips five bucks on a hundred dollars. At a fine dining place, by the way. The argument for and against restaurant tipping has been going on as long as restaurant tipping. OK, and many restaurants, including a number uh, since I come from the northwest of the United States, Portland and, and Washington, more liberal areas uh, in terms of in terms of labor laws and stuff like that. Well, in in those areas. The uh, pardon me, my 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 brain left me there for a moment. Speaking speaking about tips, okay. Uh, oh, in those areas, a number of entrepreneurs said, "Okay, we want to do better. We want to do better. We want to pay our serving staff and kitchen staff and and busing staff. We want to pay them a reasonable salary, and we want to end tipping." And so we're going to put on the menu, here's the prices, there's no tipping, your gratuities, your gratuities figured in. Guess what? They did, most of them didn't succeed. There were some really big ones that were really well funded and they didn't succeed. And it's not because it wasn't a damn fine idea and probably pretty fair. It's because it wasn't part of our culture at this time. In different places, in different times, it is part of the culture. So, so we've got a, we've got a moving target here. Okay. And, and when we as human beings, especially low paid labor and uh, 
let's call it not the not the wealthiest of consumers. When we're facing off against each other, fighting for the scraps and the corporation are making billions, we really got to look in the mirror. We really got to ask ourselves, are we just being manipulated into going after each other or are we really facing some unjust situation? And I'm just going to tell you, I don't believe it. If you're a DoorDasher and you accept a shitty offer that's going to lose you money and you don't get a tip, you can be mad at nobody but yourself. You're being gamed. You're being coerced to have a high acceptance rate to accept every order because that's what feeds the corporation and that's what the game is telling you to do. That's on you. That's why I'm writing this book so that you can be an informed user of gig apps and you can turn down those offers flat. And when DoorDash tries to game you and tell you you're not going to get gold stars, you go, I don't care. Who cares about your gold stars? I worry about money. For, for 10 bucks, I start my car. For seven bucks, I don't start my car. That's how it works. I don't care what the consumer tips or what they don't tip. I don't care what your intermittent reinforcement and your surprises are. I don't care what your hidden tips and rewards are. What you show me up front is what I do. And that's what a real contract is. That's what a non-gamed contract is. That's what a legal contract is. And that's why this is a bunch of horse shit. And this is why it pisses me off to no end is because they have succeeded, not just in fleecing consumers, fleecing merchants and retailers and restaurants who are no longer making profit on this business and screwing labor. They've turned us against each other. And there's really just nothing more freaking disgusting Yep. than what they're doing in that. And again, Dashing Trader can call me on the damn phone tomorrow. Believe me, I'll answer the call and we can talk about it because I cringe at Pedro and Dashing Trader, all these people who think that they're speaking out and they, they're just, they're ignorant of the reality of what this system is. And that doesn't make them bad people or stupid or anything else. It makes them unaware of the system that they pretend that they're fighting but it's their own narrative in their head. They're not fighting anything. They can go yell at themselves in the mirror and have the same effect. It's sad. It's very, very sad. Yeah, I, th yeah, I think, I think um, well, I'll do, I'll reach out to both of them. I think that'd be a conversation I would want to see. Because um, like I said, they don't have, it's like, for example, Pedro had on, um, you know, the, the corporate shell of um, DoorDash, um, um, uh, DoorDash Diaries. And he couldn't really ask him hard hitting questions, but he still hit him with some questions because, you know, it was a respectful conversation where, um, you know, when you're at the level that Pedro's at, you want to keep it respectful. You don't want to, you know, hit them with the got you, mo got you questions. So it was a good interview, but, you know, it wasn't really any head hitting. But with you going on at, um, against Pedro and actually, I don't want to say against Pedro, but going with different point of views on that situation and going against, or let me stop saying against, but going against, uh, head to head with, um, uh, Dash and Trader, because y'all both got different point of views on um, what works with the tip culture. Um, I think it'd be a good conversation. A lot of people want to hear, because you got a lot of people in the comments who support what you're saying. They think that we as drivers should not expect to get a tip. Like the one comment here um, with Jay Rule, he said that you shouldn't work a job, you expect the tip. But here's the thing, with these livery apps, you have to get tips for it to work. If you don't get tips, you, you will make under minimum wage after uh, before gas you make um under minimum wage because you would only make 250 a delivery you know you get three deliveries an hour max you're making 750 and you, it's yeah. rare now what was that you can't take those orders you can't no but the, you but can't. no but the thing is here's the thing in my market in la biggest one of the biggest cities um in the country um you literally have to take five dollar orders going three miles okay. because otherwise you won't have it you won't have any work you log once out again that's why i'm going to that's, yeah, that's why I'm going to get a nine to five and I'm going back to college because is, I have to, is, that's what I have to do. This is back to the status quo bias, Dennis. You think you yeah. got to do it because you did it yesterday. You think you got to do it because you did it last year. You think you got to do it because that's what out, what's out there. And that's how they got you. I mean, Door, DoorDash sneaked into our house during a pandemic and, and stole everything we got. And now the pandemic's gone and, and we think they're our boss. This is, this is absolutely absurd. And let me tell you something what respectful is in a conversation. I used to deal with CEOs and CFOs and people like that. There are no bigger megalomaniacs and assholes on the planet with bigger egos than somebody with a CEO title. Um, and I've even had one before and it's, it's not as good as it sounds.
So these people are literally batshit crazy because all they do every day is walk around with people saying, yes, yes, yes. And then when they're not in the room, people say, you know what Henry said? You know what Henry said? You know what Henry said? So these people become the little gods of their fiefdom, right? They be, they become yeah. little rulers of their world, okay? And so what we've allowed is for these gig apps to come in and dictate the terms of, of our work and our humanity in ways that don't make logical sense. And here's what I think respectful is when you're dealing with a CEO, yeah. when you're dealing with a company, when you're dealing with somebody who thinks that they've got all the answers, you know what respectful is? Transparency and truth. That's what full dash closure is about. That's what this conversation is about. That's why dashing trader is wrong. That's why Pedro is wrong. They can't be right. You know why? Because they don't know the transparency and they don't have the truth. And if you don't have transparency and, and truth, you can't be right. Right. They're, they're just they are just. Unquestionably incorrect about their assumptions and whether they socially and mentally have a narrative that thinks that it should be a different way doesn't matter. I got a narrative that thinks that people should you know, drop everything that they're doing and read my whole book tomorrow and everything I've ever read. Guess what? Not going to happen. I wish it would happen, but you know what? The world doesn't go by my wishes and the world doesn't go by Pedro's wishes or dashing traders wishes and DoorDash isn't the world. Right? So we're, we're, again, we're, we're so far underground that we're never going to see daylight. It's not a, it's not an argument. It's a fact. No, you're absolutely. I, I, I agree with you. Make some good points here. And I'll tell you this too, by the way, um, um, I'm going to link your YouTube channel again. People are asking for your um, YouTube channel. People are interested yeah. in this conversation. So I, I, I told you. Everything, no, I'm just about to catch up. I told you me, about this before we came on. Yeah. Go ahead. Everything, everything that I've pretty much ever done, including getting arrested a whole bunch of times and all kinds of stuff, because I've done civil rights uh, activism and work for a very long time. If you put in Jeff Thomas Black into Google, you'll get a whole bunch of stuff. You'll have a long, you'll have a long read ahead of you, and you get to watch some videos. You can watch me get arrested. You can watch me get my head smashed into a marble floor. Whatever turns you on, man. Uh, okay, so, so real quick, Jeff Thomas Black, you'll find me on Substack, you'll find my YouTube, you'll find my Twitter, uh, you'll find Medium. I've got lots of civil rights articles, police accountability articles on Medium. Jeff Thomas Black and Google, you'll find me. And I absolutely answer every email, every message. If you've got a question about gig apps, you've got a question about anything that we talked about tonight, you know, I'm about writing for and serving the people. That's what, that's what gets me up in the morning. So I'm into it, man. Uh, okay. So here's not to cut you off. Here's the man at hour. This is when I started doing this YouTube. Okay. When I got this um, comment and I got the subscribe hey, hey, from this guy, I yeah, it made, it made, it made, it made me feel like, it made me feel like I made it. So if uh, I got told, I don't think Pedro and Kamora is probably busy working, but Pedro, as I just told him, maybe y'all should connect, and that would be a great conversation. Pedro goes on on Sundays, so maybe you know if he has you on. I mean, that would be something that uh, people want to no, hear because you knows. guys are both articulate. I've been watching Pedro for a long time. I've commented on his videos, and and look, I mean, Pedro is a super sharp guy, and he's the first guy to be talking about that this gig economy is not the end of the road. It's the beginning of the road, right? Pedro knows the score. He's been doing this stuff. There's, there's, there's no, you know, he's, Pedro is not uh, getting the, the wool pulled over his eyes. And I actually appreciate very much his honesty in the way that he deals about, he deals with these things. He's probably, you know, a nicer guy than I am. Almost certainly. Uh, I get a little bit, uh, angry and fired up at the corporations and not so much at the people. But I, I would just, I would just again say that, that the system is what workers need to stand up against the gig economy system, the DoorDash system, the Uber system, the Lyft system. I just can't go with people fighting each other, man. It's just the wrong way to go because we are all the proletariat. We are all the ones that are struggling to get by, feed our families, work, 
whether it's the gig economy, whether it's a, it's a nine to five job, whether it's anything else, whether we go into an entrepreneurial venture, we're the ones carrying that bag. And I just, I just can't stand by as a human rights and civil rights person and watch people confront each other on video and think that it's a good thing. I think it's, it's very dysfunctional. And I, I, I plead with people, not that anybody gives a shit about my opinion, but I plead with people to not do that because it's, it's just simply not working and it's not true. Yeah, I mean, one thing I'll say, and, and by the way, the life of Kelly, I see you there, um, just just heads up, that your conversation is a conversation I'll have another time because you know your, their market, they're in, I believe, Texas, um, and they don't understand, they're in Phoenix, so they don't understand that um, their market is probably booming, but in California, there's, it's oversaturated with drivers. But one thing you should do before you even go on, if you guys were to connect and, you know, um, do a live together, um, you should watch this video he did three days ago. And it actually was, he actually smacked me back to college because I saw his video. And Pedro, he's been nice, Pedro, for the past um, um, few months. But he turned into the, the mean Pedro who don't play no games. And he went in on people such as myself. Who all we do is we come on here, we complain about how life sucks with, because these gig companies, we continue doing them. We're not coming up with no solutions, no plans. And then we want to, you know, even though I didn't really call him out on the conversation because I, I'd say, shit, I mean, he should have done it the way he did it because he did it respectfully instead of just, hey, um, why do you work for DoorDash or this and that? So that video, he pretty much went in and said, look, he is trying to better himself, you know, better his channel. He's trying to make something great for himself. So why would he go and do got you moments and and try to, you know, be disrespectful to the guy who's having a conversation with them. And he went in and told people such as myself, who all we do on here is just complain and talk about what we could have done, what should happen. And we're not doing nothing. Nothing's going to change without action. So my action was to, uh, based on that video and a bunch of other people um, I've been, you know, listening to, but I've been trying to, you know, you know cloud out of my mind here, uh, block out of my mind. I went, enrolled in college. I start the 6th of February and I'm going cybersecurity. I'm going to go get a nine to five to work part time. That's what I'm doing to exit rise share. And I know it's going to be hard in the next two years, but that's action that actually is going to change my life and make things better for me. And that's what, you know, Pedro, he's making it make sense. But I get it. There's a lot of us, including myself, radical YouTubers who do rise share who we continue to go in and just, you know, gripe and, get angry at the companies, but nothing's going to change. So the best you can do is walk away and move on. So that's, so, that's I want to make that clear. He did put that out there a few days ago. You know, he's not on the, no, he calls people clowns. Yes, but not to their face. Yeah. And, but and it's more I humor hope, at this point. Because I hope, you are, I don't have friends that don't tip. I, I hope that. You're a clown you if you don't tip, in my eyes. Yeah. I, I, and that's my personal ethic too, but, but that's again, personal. And, and I hope, that nobody thinks that I'm that I'm criticizing individually dashing trader or Pedro. I watch Pedro almost every video he puts out. He puts out probably five or six a day. And I've watched his evolution through through multiple phases, including last year when he said, My mental health is being affected. I'm cutting off DoorDash for the for the rest of the year. Okay. And so that's why I want to step back to what you're saying is that people are complaining on YouTube. Yes and on TikTok and everywhere else. Why? Because our mental health is being affected. People are being gaslighted. They don't know where to turn. Their income is being decreased. Their working conditions suck. Yep. They're being, they can be uh, deplatformed or they can be kicked off the app at any time, you know, with or without uh, cause. So, the advice that that we're talking about about looking at the next step in life is is precisely what I'm saying is that there's a workforce here. It's not the gig economy workforce. This workforce has been here before the gig economy, and we're going to be here after the gig economy, right? And there will be an after the gig economy because this is a bunch of bullshit, okay? And so yeah. after the gig economy, we do have to have a place to go. We can't stay trapped in this vortex while they take us to zero because they will happily, happily take us to zero. Oh, yeah. Okay. Now, I want to jump back to what you said about different markets. DoorDash knows and DoorDash planned <laughs> and operated as such prior to the pandemic that the markets that could potentially be profitable for last mile delivery 
were major cities and metropolitan areas. Now, what the pandemic did is it made DoorDash go to every small to mid-sized town in this entire nation and to 27 nations around the world. This pandemic really did this in, and it wasn't just the people that it killed during the pandemic. It's what it left us as, a, as an economy and as employment with this shitty gig economy, okay? So DoorDash knows full well that there are viable markets in Manhattan and in Phoenix, Arizona, and in you know San Diego and in Seattle and Portland, okay? But that's not the whole country, okay? That's major metropolitan areas. And by the way, I used to live in New York. There have always been delivery services in major cities because there's density, right? There's a restaurant two blocks away, not seven miles away. There is no efficiency in taking Burger King seven miles to somebody's house. There's somebody's losing money, okay? There's just no possible way to deliver a Burger King order to somebody's house $7 away and have it be a viable economic uh, proposal. So the only reason that this exists today, including rideshare, is by subsidy of investors by the, by the billions of dollars. They're buying the market, they're buying our labor, and then once they're done with us, once they've bought us, guess what? They own us. And, and that's where this shit's heading right now. This has been around long enough. They're getting us down towards zero where they own us. And I ain't being owned. I can just turn off that app. And so can Pedro, and he did. And he's, he's, on door, he's talking about DoorDash now, but with a whole different perspective because he knows what it is very well, okay? And, yep. you know, I hate talking about Pedro while he's listening and can't be in the conversation. I wish he was right here. But, you know, he's one of the leaders in this community and his his voice means a lot. And I respect it a lot. So, yeah. you know, this is part of a larger conversation that that won't end tonight. And, you know, we probably should wrap it up tonight because we're about two hours and 11 minutes. And I, okay. I can't imagine anybody wants to listen to us too much longer. I'm not sure I want to listen to us too much longer. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to come back on live. But here's the thing. I want to mention, yeah, with Pedro, reach out to his, um, I don't know if he has his email or whatever on his um, page, but he goes on Sundays. You should jump on because here's the thing. I wouldn't want him to jump on this live with you because, you know, he more than 40 people need to see that live. Because you're I'm, super. I'm easy to find and always happy to talk to any, any yeah. of the folks. Oh, absolutely. Team. But I. But he has bigger, he has a bigger, um, you know, viewership. Yes. And I would rather more people here because more people deserve this conversation and what, you know, you're um, explaining to people because a lot of people don't really know because you've been doing research for years on this. A lot of us just go off what we see, but you've been actually researching this. And I think it would be a better conversation and on his I, platform, you know. And when I was in the thick of doing it, I did not know these things. I only learned these things, right, after I quit doing this and researched this for about the last seven, eight months of my life, seven days a week, okay? So this is, this is not knowledge easy to come by, number one. But I do want to emphasize to everybody, I'm making the book free on Substack because of you, right? This book is written with all these YouTube content creators and fellow dashers and fellow gig workers and fellow laborers in my heart. That's why I'm writing this book. You are who the book is for. And I also have an audio book and podcast. I read it to you. You don't even have to read it. You can play it in the book while you're doing it. It's on Apple Podcasts, on Google Podcasts. It's on Spotify. It's on all of them. Okay. And I'm so gonna share, go, I'm going to share that, by the way. Yeah. Here's you your, go, now is your, your info there? Yep. You go to Substack, you can listen to the podcast, you can read the book, you can listen to the podcast and read the book. There's lots of links in there. There's videos in there. There's music in there. There's three chapters done so far and a whole bunch more coming. But uh, it's, it's a really big project and it's a big project because it's not really about DoorDash. It's about labor and the gig economy and artificial intelligence and where our world is going today. We just happen to be the first best victims of, of this heinous system. So absolutely, I, I encourage everybody to go on there, subscribe. I am keeping it free for you, period, on Substack. Uh, I will publish the book and I've got other projects and 
And I certainly am looking for all the support I can get in different ways, but I'm gonna make this, uh, this content available to the people who need it. Uh, and it's right there right now, and I'm here for you guys. Absolutely. It's, yep. it's yep. super great uh, to spend this time with you, Dennis, because you and I talked for the first time about yeah, appreciate seven, it. seven, eight months ago when I first started intensively researching this. And, uh, you know, when you and, I, when you and I talked, you were having a hard time. I watched your video, and you were pretty down. Oh, yeah. and that's kind, going kind of what started this, con this, this uh, conversation. Finally, we talked about doing it. But I felt like uh, now is the time because you were down and you were looking for a new path in life. And I thought this was a great opportunity for you, too, to show who you are, because I believe in you, Dennis. I think you're a super hard work, really intelligent guy who deserves a good job and a good wage Appreciate and that. a good life. And I would encourage anybody. You can reach out to me or you can reach out to Dennis. If you got a job for Dennis, if you got some work in the LA area, if you can help him out with actually some some decent work that is uh, dignified and and can be done, uh, I would encourage you to do that because I think Dennis is a really uh, spectacular and special guy, and uh, it's it's really a privilege to come on your channel, Dennis, and spend some time with you. I appreciate that. Appreciate that. Yeah, I appreciate I appreciate you even taking time to you know come on here and you know, share wealth of knowledge that you have. And I appreciate that. Definitely. I mean, I'm going to apply to Verizon. I think that's the latest um, to-do list on a to-do list because gotta uh, be I can do that part-time. Well, there's got to be some yeah, small the, the biggest is down there that, oh, yeah. that might need somebody like you as well. So, oh yeah. I mean, the biggest, and then I, biggest thing is the school. So that's the biggest thing. Just focus absolutely. on the school and just making part-time money just to get by until I finish, um, because, you know, that's going to be rewarding and it's going to be fulfilling, you know, once I'm complete and I'm actually in my, um, I'm looking, as I told you before, cybersecurity. So, yeah, um, you know, my biggest thing is I got to stay away from ride share. I mean, I, I today I even itched to go and do Spark, but thank God that I turned the app on. I didn't get one delivery and the app, the phone's been on this whole time and I haven't got one um, offer. So it's. It's risk reward, right? I, I mean, I basically the way that that I see it in my life now, the risk of gig work is too high for the pay that we receive. I just can't do it anymore. I can't physically make myself do it because I just don't believe that the benefit is there. So, final thing, I want to just say a final thing for Dennis and I log off. Um, thank you, everybody. I will come back to this chat. Every single question that you guys pose in here, I will answer. I promise. And absolutely, if you go to my Substack, you go to the podcasts and the book and you send me a question there, I'll answer it too. Um, it's, it's been great. I, I, it's a, it's a really a huge weight off my soul to get a chance to really spend some time talking to this community and just, just really laying it out there of, of what we see. Cause this is, this is painful stuff, man. I, I gotta be honest. When I watch, my friends like you and Pedro and other people being gaslighted and being frustrated on video. It just, it just tears me apart. I can't stand it. It just, mm -hmm. it just infuriates me. And I think we've all got a better future than this present hell that we're being put through with this gig economy. So mm -hmm. peace, everybody. Thank you, Dennis. Yeah, there, and there's his, there's his link. So you guys can screenshot and you can go, you know, his, um, his book, audiobook, podcast on Apple. You know, you got his Twitter info right there, and you got his YouTube channel that I'm hoping that he puts more content on. He'll have this also on his YouTube channel, I'm pretty sure. Um, so definitely, um, um, screenshot that I, I do have yeah, some definitely. videos on my YouTube channel, and I'll put some more up, but I want this to be on yours, Dennis. I've, been, I've, oh, got, I I've, got, I've got plenty of venues to uh, to share my work, and and I think this is, uh, this is, this is your work. This is about you, and I specifically wanted to do this with you. So I'm glad we did it and uh, it. Right. have a great night, brother. I'll right. talk to you soon. I appreciate it. Definitely. Um, yep. Enjoy the time. Have a good night. You too. Thanks everybody. Yeah, definitely.